That was unexpected. What's up, everybody? It's another evening edition of Wakanda Whiskey and Blurred Them. I'm your host, Paul, and with me, as always, my boy, Mark. What's going on? Happy Can Friday. Can you be a little Friday. bit more? Yeah, let, get, give, me, give me a pound. Dude. Give me the power pound. There you go. You awake? Yeah, I'm wide awake. Wide awake. Oops. Well, cool, man. So what are we going to be sipping on today? Oh, the same thing we had last week, right? Well, for me, no, I just made an old fashioned uh, with some benchmark because I need to go ahead and finish this bottle. So I just had to make old fashioned. Not really sipping on it. I honestly forgot I had that Uncle Nearest back there. So I just poured myself some more of the Uncle Nearest, but I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to regret this in the morning. I'm also going to add a splash of the brown sugar bourbon. Why would you do for that? For sweetness. That's... I said for sweetness, and it's only a dash. And then, because I'm really wild and crazy tonight, A&W cream soda. Oh, you just ruined the Uncle Nearest. It's not all that great. It's that's uh okay. More power to you. Straight cocktail hour on Wakanda Whiskey and Blurred. So um if you before, hold on, may hold on, have... before, we get, before we get started, did you check your DMs? Did you see the pictures I sent you? Yeah, we'll get into that later, man. I saw the pictures. That's what we should start out with. Talk about um, oh boy, before we get into it. You want to start with that? No, we're not start with that. That's depressing. <laughs> Besides, it's going to take me a minute to bring that up. All right. So Mark and I have been doing a retrospective on Black Panther comics, and most recently, we've been working on what have we been working on most recently? Volume three, the priest run, and we are up to number six right now. This was a while. So basically, year. like Paul, basically, like Paul was saying, whenever we don't have any Black Panther related uh, books released this week, we've dug into the crates and we've started reviewing the old books. You know, we did Jungle Action, a couple of issues of the Jungle Action. But then we just decided to focus on um, volume three, which is the priest run. And we're up to issue number six. And I'm going to tell you, as many issues of, as many issues as volume three had, it's going to take us like three years to get through volume three. Because I think he had like 62 issues, <laughs> give or take. Man, we, listen, we're going to have to start doubling up. We're going to have to start reading like, Whenever we don't have any Black Panther stuff, we're going to have to go like two, three books because it's going to take us forever to get through volume three. And we still got to do, obviously, the Huddling Run. Right. Well, let's say who, who's, let's see who's in the chat. What's up, chat? Sorry, I was ignoring all of you. I apologize. As I said, the show is usually just me and Mark just doing what we normally do, even if we didn't have an internet stream. Which is drink whiskey, talk comics, and whatever else we want to talk about. You guys are just kind of voyeurs on what we normally do. But let's say what's up to everybody in the chat. What's up to Derek H and H Comics? Pericles Dragon Balls in the building. Thank you, sir. You got a phone out again, like you did last week. I think it was. He was only in for like five minutes. You're gonna stick around well, for the long stick haul. Uh, Derek saying, shout out to the smoke to detector batteries and mostly prioritized <laughs> video clips. So he's th that, throwing uh, shade and doing a flex in the same statement. This guy. I mean, all right, great. Autumn Sugar, we haven't seen you in a minute. Where you been hiding? You, 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 you like hanging out with somebody else on, 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 on the Friday night? Someone else's show? But welcome back. Welcome back. Glad to see you. All right. So 
Black Panther Volume 3, issue number six. Now, if you recall, you know, T'Challa just defeated Mephisto, punched the dude in the face, ran the fade on Mephisto, and is feeling pretty good about himself. Um, not every day you get to beat the devil at his own game. But now he's got a new a new opponent to go up against. Craven the Hunter. Craven the Hunter. Now this is a Liskinov Kravinov. I can't say this guy's name. It's Russian. Yeah, he's not Ruski. Um He's not for those who don't know, Craven, Craven yeah. is normally a Spider-Man villain. And I want to say this is the first time in comics that Craven and Black Panther go up against each other, if I remember correctly. I can't recall them going up against each other on any other books with this being the first time. So yeah. Um you know, priest writing is incredible. I love the fact that we're doing this retrospective because looking at these books 20 years later, 30 years later, um, really gives you a, a great perspective on, on how just how talented this man is and how incredibly well done this run was. What was kind of interesting in this particular issue were certain references that were you'd have to live back then or be familiar with what was going on in the times in 1999 to get. Um, mainly Bill Clinton is still president. Um, and so the issue begins with Everett Ross, who's our literary device to He's be the Eric. common man to look at the Chala through the third eye, so to speak. Um, he's in trouble with the president because uh, Everett was assigned to escort Black Panther in his walk about the United States. And it suddenly occurred to everyone, oh, wait, the United States has actually never rolled out the red carpet ever for the king of Wakanda. Maybe we should do that. That's probably pretty good considering it's an election year next year. And... Um, Bill Clinton wants to make sure his vice president, Al Gore, gets elected president of the United States. So you got to get the black vote. And Black Panther is a very popular figure amongst the African-American community. And this book touch, I mean, it sounds like I'm being tongue in cheek, but these are actual like excerpts of the book. I mean, Priest did not like mince words about his take on the state of America at that time. Um, What's crazy about that is T'Challa is a foreign individual. He's not American, has no American mm -hmm. citizenship. He's the ruler of a foreign nation. As Paul was talking to him, we'll probably get to it in the book, but you have people, American citizens, presumably New York citizens, talking about how T'Challa is their hero. Understand, as far as black heroes, you already had Luke Cage, who is a native New Yorker. You've got Sam Wilson, the Falcon. You've got at that time, you had Storm, um, Dr. Voodoo, uh, James Rhodes. I don't, I can't recall if a lot of people knew that James Rhodes was War Machine by this point. But the point is, you had a Certainly lot Falcon of Falcon as well. Who? Falcon. I said Sam Wilson. I said Sam. Oh. Um, you have a lot of people latching on or glomming on to T'Challa as their hero. Then fast forward 18 years later, we in America did the same thing with the Black Panther property with his right. first movie. So we view him, even though he's a quote unquote foreigner, we view him as out. So I just found that that was interesting that Priest did this in 1999. Uh, but I'm very glad you mentioned that because that's exactly the point I was going to make. Um, you see a lot of similarities between how the black community reacted to having T'Challa on in the United States to what you saw in 2018 when Wakanda, when Black Panther the movie came out. 
very similar reactions. Let me show you some excerpts to that point. Well, hold on a second. Go, go, go to the start of the book where you see, because a lot of these names I had to look up again. Now, were you poli sci? I don't remember. Were you poli sci major? Yes, of course. Uh, oh, well, well, it's not surprising. But a lot of lawyers, before they go to law school, when they're in college, they are poli sci majors. I was a poli sci major. Paul was as well. I my whole goal of going to law school, I planned on being a politician. So I was heavily interested in politics at that time. And priests is sitting up here mentioning people whose names I hadn't heard of in yeah, like yeah. forever. On the very first page, he mentions Trent Lott. Well, Trent Lott was the uh, was a U.S. senator from Mississippi, who I just discovered earlier tonight that mm -hmm. he's still alive. He was the former. Wait, Trent Lott is still alive? A lot of still alive. He's like 82, 85. Wow. And so um Trent Lott was from Mississippi. He was the Senate majority leader uh at some point during the Clinton years. And he served, I wrote this down. He served in the US Senate from 1989 to 2007. So basically during Clinton and all of Bush II's term in office. So yeah. So you know. Priest infused this book specifically with politics of the day, of late 19th century, I'm sorry, late 20th century politics and politicians, because, you know, Everett Ross is a, he's not a diplomat, what do you call it? He's a... He's an attache. He's an attache, but there's a word that I want to, a bureaucrat. Everett Ross is a bureaucrat. Nikki is a bureaucrat. And so, you know, that's politics. And I can, as a poli sci mage, I really appreciate how Priest infused this specific issue with all the politics of the day. Um, <laughs> you know, I just want to read these these little these little ex. Everett Ross is behind closed doors with President Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton's that like, like Bill Clinton. that doesn't look like Bill Clinton. I thought that was Reagan at first. It it, it, it was Bill Clinton. So he's like, well, Elton Ross, like, why is it that? You've got this T'Challa running around tearing up the place. And then Everett is like, Really? You guys are giving me flack about this? And then he says, Look, if your number is in free fall, he's talking about his vote numbers, his approval numbers. It's not OCP's fault. It's a country the size of New Jersey sitting on a lump of magic metal. And he goes, Whose king you never even invited for dinner until you found the CBC, the Co Congressional Black Caucus looking to better deal Al, Al Gordon, in 2000. Now you've got your ear to the men's room stall waiting for Trent Locke's flush to show which direction the salmon are swimming. I mean, these are like references to what's really, as Mark says, of what's really going on in politics at the time. Kind of showing the, uh, you know. <laughs> See, that doesn't, look, that doesn't look like Clinton. It damn this this like looks like Muhammad Ali, Ali honestly. That's right. That was in this picture, but it, but it is Bill Yeah, that's funny. Kind of crazy. Kind of crazy. But yeah, I you know, I I really appreciated this book. And you know, as I've been saying for the past five weeks when we've been doing this, and we really need to do two or three issues per week. But um, I haven't read this book in like 25 years. Yeah, and I'm right, just right, here chuckling. As I'm reading it, it was it was it was well done, because after these pages, there are five, I count them that there are five maybe six pages of nothing but action, and one of the things that Priest does in his writing is it's never really a linear story. Like you start at you know Tuesday, go all the way to Friday or whatever the case may be. He'll start at Tuesday, then jump back to last Wednesday, then bring you back to the present time. Then going forward to Saturday. In this story, we're talking about currently, and then he's reminiscing, talking to Val. Um, I, I'm sorry, what's her name? Nikki. He's talking to Nikki. Nikki about what happened and why he found why he ever found himself in the predicament that he was in. And then on the very next pages, we see T'Challa going up against um, I almost say Killmonger, going up against Craven. And it's five pages, maybe six of nothing but action very limited dialogue but straight action and it was it was beautiful 
now a lot of people now this is when T'Challa didn't have a vibranium suit. This is probably just straight up cotton or whatever. Actually, no, 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 no. He he did have a vibranium suit. But here's the thing: Craven has nothing but regular knives, so I would not think that his knife would be able to penetrate a vibranium suit. A, you don't know what his 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 knives are made out of. It could be adamantium. They could be vibranium, for that matter. B, um, just like how you have a bulletproof vest can absorb the blow from a, 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 a bullet, bulletproof vest can be penetrated with with sharp objects, with knives. So I think it's kind of the same same concept. Although I hear you, I to me, this is a quote-unquote plot hole. I, I get what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. But I don't know that I necessarily uh, agree with that. But, you know, these guys are throwing just straight hands. And at the end of this, T'Challa is defeated. You know, and I know Ooh, a lot he lost. He lost. I know a lot of people like saying that T'Challa can hand to hand beat Wonder Woman. I put a poll I put a poll up on the Twitters uh, a few months ago whether or not T'Challa could beat Diana uh Wonder Woman hand to hand. And more people thought that he really could. Well, T'Challa is great fight, without question. Craven, although somewhat super superhumanly advanced, but not by much. He defeated T'Challa, and this wasn't a ruse. He T'Challa basically got his ass whooped, and so well, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I'm just, I'm just saying. I mean, T'Challa is not this undefeatable hero that a lot of people like to think he is. He is definitely a top ten hand to hand combatant in Marvel Universe on planet Earth, but he's not invulnerable. He's not somebody who can't be beat, as we see here. Now. Correct. A few things. One of the things Mark mentioned, people often make the comment, you know, Black Panther's too OP. Black Panther fans think he can beat everybody. True Black Panther th fans know that T'Challa has been beaten before in fights. That's, But that's not his superpower. That's not his main superpower. His superpower is thinking five steps ahead of everyone else. Um... It's interesting because how you see, well, I don't want to jump ahead, but remember T'Challa always has plans within plans within plans. And all he knows is that he's at a dinner, a state dinner, the White House with the president and all these people around. And suddenly, all of a sudden, Craven the Hunter decides to come at him and try and, and, and try and get him. You got to wonder why, right? Because that's what T'Challa does. He doesn't sit there and worry about the who, what, where, when, and how. T'Challa's always wondering why. And so I really question um, whether he was defeated or did he allow himself to be defeated because he wanted to see where this was going to go. How is he going to find out who hired Craven the Hunter to come after me because Craven Hunters, he either does stuff for sport or he does it because he's a mercenary. So, you know, sport wise, he kind of just wants to defeat you in battle well enough. The other part of it is somebody hired him to go after T'Challa. T'Challa might want to know who that is because remember, T'Challa um, is exiled from his country for all intents and purposes. He knows that there's an usurper in Wakanda taking it over in Achebe. Um, he knows that just a few issues ago, his brother, White Wolf, has been behind the scenes doing things. He's got a lot of enemies hiding in corners and in his shadows, and he and all of a sudden, Craven the Hunter comes after him. Coincidence? I think not. So he's wondering who hired this guy. In order to, in order to find who that out find out who that is, he's got to allow himself to get captured. Okay. So That's just what I'm thinking. It's not like read I've, I've, I read ahead and find out what happens next. So you read ahead? I read ahead 30 years ago. <laughs> so you so you don't have a recollection of what happens in the next issue? I do have a, a slight recollection of what happens in the next issue. Okay, I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen next. Um. Yes. You know, you know, like 
like Paul said, this very well could very well be a ploy on T'Challa's part. But, you know, from the visuals that we see in this book, um, he just got his ass whooped, you know? Um, I don't know how much further you want to go into this particular issue, having well, seen there's, that. There's, there's, there's some other cool tidbits here and there I wanted to share. Right. And um, that's one of the things I want to talk about is a couple of other names that were dropped in this book. Um, here's, here's an interesting visual. Now, this is Zuri. This is like, T'Challa's protector slash mentor slash teacher. He was his bodyguard. He was the bodyguard and friend of his father, King T'Chaka. And he is such a revered figure in Wakanda that that spear you see him hold, that's the spear of Bashinga himself. That is a spear usually held by the kings and queens of Wakanda. And it has been bestowed upon Zuri for safekeeping. Um, so that's how revered a figure he is. But what's interesting is look at what he has on his head. He has. And that's what I was wondering. A is he part head. of the Jabari tribe? Huh? Is he part of the Jabari tribe? Because when you I saw that, that, that was my first thought. My first thought. You got. You got to wonder. We do know. That you know, Jabari can be some big dudes from eating all those fruits and berries uh, that have been irradiated by the uh, vibranium mound. I don't know, but um, this dude—I mean, he—he he pretty much looks like Man Ape right there. Well, yeah. So yeah. the question we know that we know that Wakanda has different religions. It's not just Bast. There are several religions. Um. In Wakanda. And Wakanda is like a lot of different African nations where they are made up of different tribes. You know, uh, for example, the first one that comes to mind is Rwanda. You had the Tutsis and the, I can't, it starts with an H. I don't remember what it was, but during the, 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 the Hutus. The Hutus and the, yeah, yeah. So basically the nations are made, are comprised of different uh, groups who, who come together and have this nation. Well, that's what Wakanda was, you know? It was an amalgam of different people who held different beliefs. It just so happened that those who revered and worshiped the panther god Bas are the ones who are in charge. And um, the Dora Milaje are comprised of women from some of these different tribes. And I think one of the reasons why they did this was to try to keep the peace because the, the Dora Milaje were considered the wives in training. And so if you're part of this obscure tribe, you send one of your best women up to the up to the capital, hoping that she will be chosen by the king to be the queen of all of Wakanda, which would elevate the status of your particular tribe. So now that that now that's actually the next thing I wanted to talk about is the other thing that we saw in this issue was kind of a semi-origin story of Nakia. So that was kind of cool. This is Nakia being selected by her tribe to become one of the um, um, Dora Milaje. Yeah. Now, to, to go back to Zuri real quick, Zuri was played by Forrest Whitaker. Nakia is how I pronounce it, was played by... Uh, God, help me out. Lupita Nyong'o. Lupita Nyong'o, right, right. And what's crazy is, Everett's talking about this, these are teenagers, like 16, 17 years old. They weren't the full-grown adult women who we ended up seeing in the movie Black Panther. And that's, you know, that's great that they do that. But it's funny, you know, I was talking about how I was reading this book today and laughing because basically Everett Ross is like, look, if it was up to me and I had some 16, 17 year old girls after me, <laughs> yeah, that was, I just, I just found it pretty funny. He said he would be like a kid with a, a fat kid with some ice cream. Let's check out what some of the people in the chat are saying. King Sigma says, I don't blame him. I like <laughs> white women too. So it seems <laughs> like King Sigma is a milkman. You a milkman, King? <laughs> Sean Damien Hill says, beautiful yeah. artwork. 
Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, and just to mention, the artwork in this is actually done by um, Joe Jusco. Yeah. Legend artist. Um, the artwork in this book is phenomenal. Now, it's already started out great with Mark Texiera doing the first few issues. Joe Jusco slides in, and there's no change in the tone of the comic by having one artist to another. But it Joe Jusco's same, art is phenomenal. It looks the same. Um, hey, shout out to Sean Damian Hill. Still got your picture here, dog. <laughs> great art, great original art. Um, Yasha says, "Hello, guys. Hello, Yasha. How you doing? Hype style, great story for sure. Good stuff in this story arc, Panther Power." Right. Yasha says, "I was thinking he was Jabari, also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hutus, thank you. The Hutus, the Hutus yes, from uh, Rwanda." But only in fiction do they work together. Dude has, a, has pet. a pet. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Zuri had a little pet lion. Why are you showing us your liquor? Because it's okay. delicious. Yeah. yeah. Any weird. Um, yes, indeed. <laughs> what so is that? That's, that? that's a milk. That's a glass of milk. He's a glass. So, so basically, his wow. uh, his idol <laughs> died the other day. I'm sure O.J. Simpson was his idol, King Milkman. <laughs> oh, that's so damn. That's car. That's cold. The man's body ain't even ain't even cold yet. All right. Um. Yeah. A couple other excerpts. Um. This book had a lot in it. They they packed a lot in this book. Yeah. A um, lot of cultural references. Look at this artwork. Good God. This artwork. Now, here's, you know, I've mentioned this previously. I don't like that depiction of T'Challa in modern times. In the past, the way that they have him draw, I'm accustomed to T'Challa having and rocking that mini fro. That's the T'Challa that I want to see. I don't like this ball headed, you know, Samuel L. Jackson as Shaft, uh, Damon, Wayne, I'm sorry, Keenan Ivory Wayans as Shane. Look to him. I'm just not. Uh, 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 ew. On it's not, it's this. This is what I wanted. This is why I brought this up. Joe Jusco is doing the artwork on this one. His version of T'Challa actually looks more like Avery Brooks. Look at this picture to the right. That is clearly Avery Brooks from The Man Called Hawk and Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Deep Space Nine. Yeah. yeah. Clearly Avery Brooks. I don't like the ball painted T'Challa at all. Well, on behalf of the ball headed brother, black goatee wearing brothers of the world, we don't care. That's our dude. So, yeah, I mean, well, the other thing interesting was introduction of reintroduction of Monica Lynn in this. And session. we haven't seen her in forever. Right. At this point, you have not seen her in forever. She was first introduced. In Avengers issue number 73, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken. Um, T'Challa's great love of his life. He even went so far as it says here to announce to Wakanda that he was going to marry this American jazz singer and make her his queen. Now, Which with when nobody it comes wanted to that. And a couple of things. In live action, I wanted Janelle Monet to play Monica Lynn because that would be right on point. Janelle Monet is a beautiful woman who can sing and she can also act. So I felt that she would be perfectly cast in that role. Yeah. Secondly, we really got to see and know Monica Lynn as a character during the uh, jungle action run because there were several stories where T'Challa was actually in. She was from Louisiana or Atlanta? Uh, somewhere down south. I don't remember where. where right. That, where. She's either from New Orleans or from Atlanta. And T'Challa spent time here in America with her there. And Even so, went to the supermarket. And so, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that she has appeared in this book. And I'm looking forward to see what Priest does with her. Because, again, I haven't read these books in 25 years and I have what no What Priest does with her? I mean, you, you really don't remember this, this run. It's, it, it gets At interesting. All. It gets interesting. Yeah. Um, the other notable thing that happens. 
is we get a little bit more backstory on yet another woman in T'Challa's life. Nikki. A new little girl named Nikki, I guess you could say that. she was. <laughs> Look. <Don't do> that. <laughs> Nikki, who is Everett K. Ross's boss at the State Department, um, who sent Everett K. Ross on his assignment to go chaperone T'Challa in the very first issue. Uh, Ross has been reporting directly to Nikki, who's actually also his girlfriend at the time. Current. Mm -hmm. Current girlfriend. Um, so a little bit of a conflict of interest there. Your boss is also your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. um, I need to call he's Nikki watching T'Challa from afar. And then you realize why that is. Look what is on her arm. She's got this bracelet with these African style etchings on it. And this is T'Challa in college. Remember T'Challa went to college in the United States and in Europe. Mm -hmm. At one point he was in the United States and here he is with her. That was his college sweetheart. And what was further interesting is some people felt some kind of way about an African prince. King at that well, yeah. He was still African royalty. He wasn't he wasn't he wasn't and he didn't have the crown yet. He was still yeah, he's still African, African, yeah, African, African royalty. Um some 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 people on campus have some feelings about this dude being some type of way with this this white woman. Mm -hmm. He specifically says when her daddy was dragging black men behind his wagon, I'm certain this was the last thing either of them expected to see. <laughs> his brother's name is Kamal. Um, I don't know. Uh, like, we'll see what his last name is here in a minute. R Rashid, something like that. And she's like, Kamal, leave him alone. He's like, shut up, Nikki. This is about the brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I should respect you. I want to admire you, but not with your face pressed up against the enemy. So here's what's interesting about that statement. He feels that the white man is the enemy, but goes to a predominantly white school. He could have gone to Howard, Hampton, Morehouse, Langston, Bethune-Cookman. I mean, there are a plethora of HBCUs that he could have gone to to get his education, but he chose to be educated by the enemy. And I just found that interesting. <laughs> Fight like, make up your mind, bro. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. And so T'Challa, and I love this page right here. This is this is storytelling at its at its best. Um T'Challa takes on these three guys. And he fights all three guys. This is before he's king. This is before he has the heart-shaped herb in his system. This is just hands and skills. Because he has been trained from an early age to be a physical combatant. Look at how beautiful this art no is. They are no match for him. Look at how look at how much story Joe Jusco tells just with visual storytelling. But look at this panther that he draws behind him. This is beautiful art. This could literally be a poster. No words, no dialogue. You can feel the action off of this of this, this artwork this, alone. This book had a lot of action in it. It really did. A lot of action. And the press. It had you, a lot you could of practically hear the sound effects in your head. That's how beautiful this artwork is. So dynamic. Now, the only thing that I'm upset about is that the artist did not have T'Challa or any of these other brothers in Carl Kanai or Crossbow. Oh. That's 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 upsetting. But other than that, it was uh, <laughs> for those uh, who don't know, for those of you who are of a certain age, back in the late nineties, Carl Kanai, Fubu, and Cross Colors were some black owned fashion brands that were all the rage. Speaking of fashion of the nineties, did you ever have any Jabot? J what? Jabot. No, I never had that. It's too I, I expensive. Could, I was the right. I was in the military and I could not afford Jabot jeans, but I definitely wanted some. 
Why is it always a blunt? Because they have more fun. Duh. <laughs> Bo Biggs oh. in the house. What's up, brother? How you doing? I'm expecting a super chat because Paul always says that. That's right. HBCUs in the house. I the watcher. Are you an HBCU grad? And if so, where? I'm more house myself. He says he remembers those men. You know, my biggest oh, thing was cross colors. I had mad cross colors when I was in college. I had one pair. I had the pair of the green ones. The lot. Like I line. had. I had the whole outfit of cross colors: t-shirt, long sleeve shirt, pants. I was cross colored out. I love me some cross colors. So, a few years ago, when Paul turned forty. Wow, we, you're just gonna put my business out there. Is, you yes. really need to put my. Do you do you want me to give you a whole birthday? Because I'll do it now. You keep messing with me. That's what I thought. So Paul had for his birthday, he had a '90s theme uh, birthday party. Yeah, and so you know, I the way we used to dress back in the day, you would have jeans, like combat boots, button down <laughs> shirt, and a tie and a hat. Right. So think Motown Philly. Think boys to men video Motown Philly. That was the style of the day. I'm telling you, if I could have found me some cross colors, bruh, I would have set that mug out. I am at NCCU right now and grew up by ECSU. Eastern Carolina. Okay, cool. What's your major? And good luck to you. Autumn Sugar says, I'm a 90s kid, so I only know FUBU. That's what's For up. Us, us. For yeah. us, by us. Here's what's funny. LL Cool J, who everybody knows, and as an aside, there's some clown on Twitter talking about how nobody in the black community really messed with LL Cool J back in the day. He's not even a blue check. He just wants views and attention. But LL Cool J was hired back around 95, 96 to do a Gap commercial. He was the Gap spokesperson. Yeah, yeah. There was a, uh, not a, a free, there was a freestyle rap that LL do, did for this commercial. He's getting paid by Gap, but in his freestyle, he dropped FUBU in the middle of his freestyle. I remember that. Yes, yeah, he did promotion for FUBU. For us, by us, keeping it on the low. Oh, yeah. The 90s, if you didn't know anything about the 90s, you just missed a great decade. You really did. The 90s. Man, black culture was so damn strong in the 90s. Yes. The Not music, the the, from everything from the music to our style, mm -hmm. to hip hop, finally learning how to um, come up themselves. Meaning, this is this is the time where you started to see a plethora of hip hop labels, right? So people were starting to realize, you know what? Why are we going to these other companies and giving them, you know, ninety percent of our profits off this music when we can go, we can create our own labels and do it ourselves. The nineties generation, rap a lot, so so deaf, yeah, um, bad boy. Mm -hmm. What was the one that Andre Harrell had? Um, Wait, Tommy Boy. Well, no, it wasn't Tommy Boy. It was um. Oh my God, I should know this. Okay, well we've got. It's where it's where Diddy, it's where Diddy got his start. Right, Diddy was an A and R uh, there. Oh, I don't remember that. Tommy Boy was black too, right? No, it was not. I'm not mistaken. Tommy Boy was not. Was not fully Uptown. Bo Biggs got it. Uptown. 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 Thank you, sir. Yeah, Uptown. I That's right. Star oh, Trek. You know, here's what's crazy. Hello. You know, Barry, um, Barry Gordy laid the groundwork and it's amazing that it took like 30 40 years for other black folks to uh get on that sort of bandwagon or follow his blueprint to financial success i the watcher says going to nccu for cybersecurity certificate to increase my skill set since i already have bachelor's degree well ain't you so, fancy okay then. correct you. He said, "Fubu was expensive, so cross colors was my thing." Exactly, I couldn't afford the Carl Kanai, and I I had Fu I had cross colors because you could they were selling that stuff out the back of their trunk. They they sell Carl Kanai everywhere. I didn't mean that. They sell they sold uh, cross colors everywhere. 
Everywhere. But I was, like I said, only had the one pair of the green ones. I didn't have the whole rainbow. I remember asking my uncle in New York when I was living, yeah, I was going to college in Florida. And I said, look, just go to like Canarsie Street in Brooklyn and just buy one from one of those bodegas, like the knockoffs. From the I was straight up like, just buy me the knockoffs. There's plenty of, there were so many cross color knockoffs back in the day. Actually, all these, all these black owned, um, um, clothing companies had knockoffs. The knockoff industry was huge. I was like, "Don't even buy me the Just buy me a knockoff." I mean, I live in Florida. No one's gonna, know, no one's gonna know the difference. You know what put me on to cross colors was T TLC when they yeah. first came out. That's all they were rocking, and we're yeah, talking. I forgot. Yeah, they absolutely were rocking. 1992. Ain't too proud to beg. If you watch that video, they have. Nothing but cross colors on. Carl and I still big in Japan. I didn't know they were still in existence. I didn't know Carl and I were still making clothes. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let me let me show this other thing that I thought was kind of cool. So after T'Challa defeats, you know, the Doctor Umar crew from this school, um, Zuri pops up, and he he says, you know, the students they fear me. And this world of skin color, a land of ignorant fools, Lord King, as is much of the globe. Your father wisely kept the realm apart from such peoples, a division not of race, but of character. Your father would disapprove of this dalliance, not because the girl is white, but because she is not of the realm. Basically, Zuri is saying she ain't good enough for you. She kid. trash, bro. She ain't, she, she not on your level. That's a shame. She is beneath you and your royal lineage. <laughs> I know King, who's in the chat right now, is probably upset about that. He was like, I'll take her. <laughs> so Nikki, Nikki remembers that. And she sees T'Challa dancing with uh, Nakia, doing the tango. And what did she do with the bracelet he gave her back in college? She's like, let me take this off and let me just put this in my purse. Cause um, so she's had. So here's the thing: we're probably talking about at least ten years, ten to yeah. fifteen years from when he was in college, and yeah. she has held on to that thing and has worn it all this time. So well, we don't know if she's worn it all this time, but she certainly yeah. brought it to an event that she knew he was going to be at. She's been wearing it all this time for special events or whatever. He put that thing on. He really did. <laughs> <laughs> he put that thing on her. Huh? He did. He put the the spear of Bashinga. All right, time out, time out, time out. Just saying. Oh God, the spear See, of T'Challa. <laughs> this is <laughs> the spear of T'Challa. I like that. That's funny. You see, uh, wow. This is why we have this specifically just for. <laughs> bunch of haters y'all are that's all i can say yo you're gonna get us canceled all right so <laughs> carl kanai is charging 150 dollars for a hoodie on their website in the year of our lord 2024 absolutely not oh wow <laughs> <King Sigma. laughs> he really loves himself some milk don't he wow Sigma. send her my He's way milk man so let me let me ask King, are you literally a Sigma? I the divine nine? I'm just curious. That's funny. That oh is wow. So you called out Bo Big and he delivered. There Bo is. Big with the ten dollar <laughs> super chat. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Obviously, I use that as money. As Bo has given over the past, you know, as long as we've been doing this, dude should get like a free shirt or something. If you guys haven't yep. done that, the, you act like we have a printing press with a whole bunch of the stock. Somebody of in the Black Comic Lord should have a t shirt or a hoodie made, get his information, and send it to him. You might be right. I am. Thank, thanks again, Bo Biggs. 
And let me take this time to say, if you're new here, make sure that you hit the subscribe, like, and follow button. It costs you absolutely nothing. We try to do this. We try to do this every Friday, but there's plenty of content throughout the week, Sunday through Saturday, that you may find entertaining if you are into black nerd culture. It is. What are you talking about, Sean? Come on now. Yeah, he's talking about why are you trying to talk about how families are made? <laughs> <laughs> frustrated fans, what's up? Well, frustrated fans, I mean, it's, it's not even the end of the show when you're here. You're not on time, but at least you're here. Appreciate you. I'm waiting. I'm in the fest <laughs> I'm waiting for uh, Jeffrey Thorne to show up. For oh, there we go. <laughs> Ken Sigma with the extra super chat. Thank you very much, sir. Very much. I had to I had to give you a sister in the super chat because you know <laughs> you don't want that. Dr. Umar want that. would be disappointed in you, King, but I'm not. <laughs> go with what you like, bro. Go, go, go have your mayonnaise sandwich. All right. So <laughs> moving on. Well, hold on a second, real real quick. Um, yeah. are you are you moving on from this book or just moving on? To no, 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 no. I was gonna go into the next the next couple scenes. This is a this book right. was packed with a lot of cool stuff. This book was good. This book was good. This, this good. book was good. good issue. So the same Dr. Umar dude actually made something of himself with that education he got from the the other man. He became a senator. Yeah. Senator Kamal Rahim. Rakim. That's his name. Kamal Rakim. And, and you so know, he's like, hey, Ricky's around here somewhere. It was the name Rakim. Rakim because of Rakim, the, the rapper. I'm I'm betting. Whatever. Rakim, Rakim, potatoes, potatoes. Yeah. Is mama name Clay? I'm gonna call him Clay. <laughs> anyway, um, he mentions the fact, T'Challa, you're here. The president invited you to this dinner. He invited no black people. Except and that's something me. that that's something that Everett Ross said very early on, about two or right. three pages. And he was apparently he wasn't joking because the senator says the same thing. The right. president literally invited no black people to the state dinner right. for the king of Wakanda, and he says, "You know what? So when I found out you were coming and they invited no people to this dinner, I made some calls myself. Um, I invited some people that actually care that you're here." And T'Challa's like, who, who are you talking about? What, you, what are you talking about? Who, who could possibly care that I'm here? He said, Black Americans. Look at that scene, okay? Easily 100,000 people, if not more. Now, at this point, T'Challa, although he is the monarch of a sovereign nation, he's also been a member of the Avengers for years. So he is world-renowned as a hero putting his life on the line in service to humanity for planet Earth. And people have respected the fact that he did that. And they came out in force to show him their love, much like we did in 2018 when his solo movie dropped, Recast T'Challa. Recast T'Challa. So um, we should probably ca count how many times you say that per episode. <laughs> So Everett Ross gets on the phone. He goes, Elaine, there's a crowd of black people outside. How many? All of them. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> this was funny. Oh, and earlier on in this issue, um, when he's when he, Everett Ross, is looking at the party attendees, seeing the lack of melanin, he mentions Spike Lee, Morehouse grad, who at the time, you know, still is a very renowned director. And so Everett is like, look, we need to go ahead and darken this party up a little bit. Let me go ahead and get Spike on the phone, see if he can get some colored folks up in here. So that was mentioned earlier on. Blurred forever. <laughs> Another super chat. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Donation. It's a donation. I thought it was a trash. Don't be hitting on me. Thank you. Getting some more people in the building. Appreciate it, every last one of you. Please, 
as you're watching the show, just want to take a second. Just take a sec, please. Hit the like button. Hit the like button for us. If you're if you're not subscribed to our channel, subscribe to the channel. It doesn't cost you anything. It helps us helps our algorithm and lets us do what we do. So moving on. Um, a real cool scene here. Because every Ross says like all black people showed up. So here's everybody. Like literally says everybody. So T'Challa goes out to greet his adoring fans. He goes, what do you want? Why have you come? And the black people respond, to see if it was true, to see if you were really here. T'Challa responds, I don't understand. I have always been among you. And then the brother responds, you were with them, the Avengers, the Fantastic Four. They don't care nothing about us. They're not our heroes. They their heroes. And now that's Franklin Richards, the son of Sue and Reed Richards, along with his uncle, Benjamin J. Grimm. And he, Franklin, doesn't understand about race relations here in America. And he's like, who's heroes? Right. And Ben has to have a very uncomfortable conversation with him later on right. about this. Right. Yeah, that was that was that was, that was, that was, a, that was a powerful moment. Yeah. Um, and then there's this other scene where he decides to respond and he goes, you're our hero. You know how we feel. He goes, I'm merely a man as any other, not here, not in this country. And T'Challa responds in any country among all peoples, we should not become polarized by self-interest, but embrace our common humanity. Right? That reminds me of the speech Chadwick Boseman gave at the end of the Black Panther movie, where he says, We're all one tribe. You know, we need to embrace ourselves as one tribe and 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 build bridges, not barriers. Same type of same type of tone, same type of speech. Um this actually reminds me, and maybe at some other show we'll talk about it. I mentioned the issue uh, Avengers 73, where Monica Lynn is first introduced. It was actually a very interesting storyline. We really should, Mark, probably do a review of those two issues, 73, 74. Um, T'Challa has his first sort of uh, discussion of race in America in those issues. Because Ooh, black people are sort of trying to, to say, you know, it hasn't been revealed, actually, that Black Panther is actually black. Weird. Do Do you recall who the writers of those two books were? I not off the top of my head. I could probably look it up, but okay, um, I'll up while you're talking, I'll look it up. He 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 actually it it hadn't actually been revealed that he was black, and when I think his mask got torn or he took off his mask, and then the media was there, they're taking pictures like the Avengers have a black member. No, we. We didn't know the Avengers had a black member. And the same type of thing happened where people were like, you yeah, you're one of us. Like, you're supposed to represent. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. And he's like, and, and T'Challa was befuddled. Like, he didn't understand why are you people so obsessed with me just because of the color of my skin? Because he's from a country where he's not really exposed to white people. They're aware of white people, but that's not part of their daily, daily lives. Um, so they're not exposed to racism like that. And so he can't understand why him just walking among them is such a big deal. Um, and Monica Lynn is the one who actually has to educate him about racism in America and how that works. And even though he's been in school in the United States, you know, that's being in school at a university is at one level, but being in the streets among the actual people is a whole nother experience that he doesn't really have a lot of, you know, history with. So Roy, we'll, we'll we'll do a review on that at some point. Roy Thomas is Roy the Thomas. writer, and the book came out. Um, the release date was December sixteenth, nineteen sixty nine. Yeah, yeah. Roy Thomas, he was definitely an ally to the people. Um, he created a, he he worked on a lot of stories that involve involve black characters. Uh, particularly John Stewart and Green Lantern over at DC. 
Oh wow. Um, Roy Thomas, Rick Buckler, these are guys that that really sort of did a lot of work with black characters back in the day. Um, let me see if there's anything else that I wanted to talk about in this issue. Well, while you're doing that, I I did. I wanted to mention a couple of the names that were dropped in this issue. We already talked about Trent Lott, who was the senator from Mississippi, who was the uh, Senate Majority Leader for a time. We, yeah. They also mentioned Patrick Moynihan, who, who I just discovered tonight, was born in my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma. But during the Nixon years, even though he was a Democrat, he served as U.S. ambassador to India. Then he was the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations before he was elected as the U.S. senator from New York, where he served from, uh, let's see, 1977 to 2001. So Patrick Moynihan, Tulsa native, uh, was mentioned in this book, as well as Pat Buchanan. Many people, if you are of a certain age, you may remember Pat Buchanan ran for the presidency in both 1992 and 96, lost both times, and then he became a conservative pundit. I discovered today that Pat Buchanan is still alive. He's like 85 years old. He's still alive. Also, Ed Ross at some point mentions the Zulu Nation. Now, I don't know if Priest meant the actual Zulu nation in Africa or, as I suspect, the Zulu nation hip-hop group collective from New York, fronted mainly by Africa Bambata. So if you are of a certain age, you know the name Africa Bambata. So they were mentioned in this book as well. Planet so, Rock. Yeah. So, you know, Priest infused this book with a lot of prominent names and culture of that time period. It, is, this it is really it. was a book of the 90s, wasn't it? In it that was, respect. This was a book of the 90s. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that, that was actually all I wanted to talk about on that book. So we're going to take a, a short commercial break and we'll talk about some other things in a second. Comics are different. Those things cannot be returned if they do not sell, okay? So that means that if they buy 10 copies of Monica Rambeau Photon and nobody buys it, they eat that money. And your local comic shop is, um, the margins are very thin, right? Times are hard for everybody. And so what that means is that it gives comic shop owners incentive to be very risk averse, right? And so you could order a bunch of Batman and you know that every month people are gonna come in and buy Batman. It's often characters of color, new characters, lesser known characters where they're like, I don't know, this could be good, but if I put this on my shelves and people don't buy it, I lose money. And I'm sympathetic to that. I, that's a real assessment that they have to make. So the way that we avoid that is you go in and you pre-order. So Paul goes in three months before the comic set comes out and says, hello, I would like to pre-order Monica Rambo Photon, number one. I'm not gonna wait till it comes out. I'm telling you now that I want it. And at that point they're like, okay, let me go ahead and order this. And in the comics world, that is the sale that counts. Not the, by the time you come into a store and purchase a comic book, that sale does not count. I know it is ridiculous. It is very silly. That is the way it is. The sale that counts is when the store orders it from the distributor. That is what they are counting. And so what that means is that when you go in and you pre-order things, it actually gives that store confidence. Like, okay, Paul said Paul's going to be back and spend his $5 on this book. So we're good. If we order this one, we know it's going to sell and we can pay our rent. We're not going to be eating this cost this month. The best thing to do is your subscription or your pull list where you go in and you say, I want you to put these in every month for me, right? And then they will set that aside in a box. <laughs> Message. Shout out to the Black Comic Lords for having me on the show and also for uh, being true believers in, the, in every aspect of comic books and nerd culture. I'm Eve Ewing, <laughs> and this is the Black Comic Lords. Hello, this is Larry Fuller, the creator of Evan, with a shout out to the fine folks at Black Comic Lords. Keep up the good work. Hey, y'all know it's me. This is OMG, and this is Black Comic Lords. 
Black Comet Lords. Yo, Black Comet Lords. Black Comic Lords. Black Comic Lords with your boy Lonzo Star. Check in. You're here with the Black Comic Lords. You're here with the Black Comic Lords. Stay demented. I am Professor John Jennings and I'm a Black Comic Lord. Black Comic Lords for life. Let's go. BCL for life, baby. Black Comic Lords. Black Comic Lords. Follow the subscribe now. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Jung seems like she would be fun to hang out with. She sees mad cool peoples, man. Mad cool peoples. Um, there is a book that came out last week. Um, that I really, if you are a, a fan of Black Panther, um, this is a book that you really need to add to your collection. It's not a comic book. It's a book book. What you say? It's called Black Panther T'Challa Declassified. It's written by Maurice Broadus. Um, I've had the opportunity to, I have the book. Um, I actually got a preview copy earlier, a few weeks ago. I've been reading the book. This is a highly detailed um, deep dive into who T'Challa is and why he is the way he is. And the way they do that is they basically take the affidavits, excerpts, reports, diary entries of several people and analyze T'Challa from many different perspectives. Um, this is a fantastic book if you're a fan of Black Panther. Um, I would I would go so far as to say this is a must read for true fans of this character. If you want to know what makes this man tick, this character tick, uh, this book really gives you some tremendous insights. Um, stay tuned. I believe we're going to be interviewing Mr. Maurice Broadus, the writer of this book, this coming Wednesday at 9 p.m. So... Uh, add this to the roster of, of really fantastic uh, Black comic creators that we've had the opportunity to interview on Black Comic Awards. Um, I'm really looking forward to this because this book is, is, is really incredible. Make sure you hit the like, subscribe, and follow on the YouTubes, the Twitters, and the Facebooks. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Frustrated fan says, this is so true now because my LCS said I order a whole lot of niche books and have that have low print runs. Yeah, I mean, pre-ordering your books. If you know the other thing that makes that that we do here at Black Comic Lords is really try to support um those books that sort of have us in them. And even moreover, black comic creators in whatever they're doing. And the best way you can put support them, honestly, is to pre-order the comics. We all love to go to our com LCSs on, on Wednesday and just go to the shelf and pick up books. But in re the reality is, although you're helping to support that LCS, those, those, those purchases mean nothing. If you want to support the book and make sure the book continues, the numbers that the publishers go by are pre-order numbers. Um, so buying books when you just calling up your house says, Hey, put that on the side for me. That's too late. You have to call months in advance and say, Hey, I found out that so-and-so uh, series is coming out or this issue is coming out in two months. Please. I'd like to pre-order it before the final order cutoff. Um, those calls, those reservations is literally a vote. It's literally a vote, just like casting a, a vote in an election um, for that book to continue. That's the best that's, way. That's to how say important it. it is. That's the best way to say it. when you pre-order a book, it is a vote to the company that produces that book to say, "Hey, we want this book to continue." So it's very, very important. 
when you find a black book specifically or a black creator specifically that you like that you vote for them to continue that's yeah. that's a very good analogy yeah. if you've got a good relationship with lcs simply get a subscription if it's a book you know you're going to get every month just tell them i add this to my subscription add this to my pull list and yeah. just automatically pull it out and i guarantee i'll buy it every month that's now, how you truly support these 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 creators and these books these characters one of, one of the things that i discovered a few years ago is that paul has was i don't know if he still does but was getting subscriptions back in the 90s from a comic book store that happens to be in my hometown of tulsa oklahoma it was greatest not great escape but um what was it called um start an i impulse creations impulse creations impulse creations is a comic book store that is in my hometown of tulsa oklahoma um they were delivering books to paul's uh address on a regular basis because he called them set it up this is in the early days even before the internet that he did this well you have the you as a consumer have the ability to do that now if there is not a comic book store in your area if there's not one that you like you can order books online you know there's that place was mile high comics mm -hmm. um which is out in denver there's impulse creations which my my is, comic shop is a really great one. My comic shop, looking. I order a lot of stuff from them. They're They'll give you thirty five percent off your pre -order. place orders to let these companies know that you want these books. If you are for whatever reason intimidated to go to a comic book store or don't want to, I don't like ordering stuff online unless it's something rare. I actually enjoy going to the comic book store on Wednesdays talking to the comic book folks in there, just interacting. I, I actually enjoy that. But if that's not something that, that you're into, there are other avenues out there for you to get these books. So it's very, very important. If but even even, to, even if, like that, Mark says, you, you, you enjoy books, going to your LCS on a online. Wednesday, even if you enjoy going to your LCS on a Wednesday, you can still do that experience, but pre-order your books through that LCS. Let them know, go ahead and put that on my pull list. Give me a subscription to that particular book. And then when you walk in on Wednesday, your books are ready for you. And here's the other thing. Here's another reason why that makes sense. Um, oftentimes, there'll be like really cool hot covers to a book. Um, when you pre-order, you have the better chance of getting those hot covers that you want, those specific covers that you want. And moreover, from a financial standpoint, most LCSs will give you a discount for pre-ordering your books, for having a pull list, for having a subscription through them. They'll discount you. Like Mark mentioned, Mal, not Mal High, um, My oh. Comic Shop gives you a 35% discount off of the cover price for, for buying, for pre-ordering your books with them. Um, another one is... Um, the one in New York. Um, oh, geez. New York. Um, I have no idea what you're talking about. My, my, geez, what's the name of this shop in New York? I don't know. But basically, while he's thinking about what shop it is, the point that I was making is this. If you don't want to go in person, if being in a comic book store for whatever reason intimidates you or whatever the case may be, there are ways for you to vote for the comic book characters. Midtown Comics. Midtown Comics. Midtown Comics. There's a way for you to so-called vote for these books to continue by um, by ordering online. Midtown Comics, Great Escape, um, Impulse Creations, Mile High Comics, blah, blah, blah. There are plethora out there where you can set up a so-called subscription to get these books sent to you on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. That's the best way you can support these 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 creators as well, because you have sometimes these creators, particularly black creators, are only given limited series to work with, um, just because the nature of the business. They they're the ones that get the limited series. Um, but if, you, if, if if if, if but those limited series can oftentimes be extended and made into an ongoing series based on pre-orders. Yeah, like you'll have people like Tom Taylor as an example who is a white writer who's very good, who will have two, three, four projects that he's working on 
at one time, but then Jeffrey Thorne isn't given anything as an example. So supporting these people when they are out is very important to have more content from them. Shout out to Jeffrey Thorne. Shout out to Rodney Barnes. And I'm rooting for everybody black in the immortal words of Issa Rae. <laughs> That's that's literally the motto of BCL. We 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 root for everybody black. Yep. All right. Um, so what do you want to talk about next? What are, we, what are we going into next? Well, 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 I would suggest that we go into Secret Origins 14, then the okay, then the uh most recent issues of Suicide Squad. You said Suicide Squad and the Secret Origins. See Secret Origins 14 first then Suicide Squad. And then if, while you're doing that, if you could pull up uh, Legends number one just to show that. I know we talked about it before, like last week, but I just want people to get a context. And the, while he's doing that, the reason why I mentioned Secret Origins number one and Legends number one. Wait, Secret Origins number one or the one 14? No, 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 no. Legends number one. Okay. Secret Origins 14. And then the most I recent issue of Suicide Squad. While Paul is doing that, the reason why we mentioned all those books, if you've been following us for about the past month or so, I've mentioned a lot how I am a huge fan of the character of Amanda Waller. Amanda Waller is a Black woman over in the DC universe who has absolutely no powers, no skills, no abilities, other than a poli sci degree. Shout out to all the poli sci majors in the world. She is a bureaucrat who works for the government. And depending on who you talk to, she's working for the betterment of the United States. Now, you may question her morals, you may question her ethics, but you can never question her motives because everything that she does, Amanda, she feels is in the best interest of America first, the world second. Shout out to Chillmonger. He's uh, coined a phrase that I had never heard before called Chick Fury. Nick Fury, obviously, is the head of S.H.I.E.L.D. over in the Marvel Universe. Well, the equivalent in D.C. is the Suicide Squad and Checkmate. And Amanda Waller is, without a doubt, without a question, one of the most powerful people in the U.S. government and the D.C. comic universe. And so these specific books that I just mentioned, Legends, number one, Secret Origins, number 14, which is here, Legends, number one, that Paul has on the screen, that is the first introduction of Amanda Waller as a character in comic books. Um, she appears halfway through the book, She's a bureaucrat, as I mentioned earlier. She is someone who's working for the United States government, who's trying to make sure that the United States first and the world second is safe. If you do not have this book, I would encourage you to try to find it and pick it up. Amanda Waller. You know, this this is not an expensive book, by the way. It is not it, expensive. It's, right. There are a lot of times where you can find it in dollar bins and things of that nature. And I've seen this book. And dollar bins before and not realizing the significance of it but i passed it by but you know i just bought it recently and I had to spend more than a dollar to get it but as a fan of this character i felt obligated to have this in my collection this book along with secret origins 14 tells us who amanda waller is as a character now, one of the things that I look at when I consider whether or not a character is a quote-unquote A-list or B-list or C-list or whatever character is how have they been portrayed in media? If you're just some also ran who appears periodically in a comic book once every five, ten years, whatever, you're a Z-list character. If you've never had a live-action incarnation of that character, you don't really mean anything. But you have to understand that Amanda Waller as a character 
has at this point had three live actions incarnations as well as a very prominent role in animation voiced by CCH Pounder in the Justice League, Justice League Unlimited cartoons of the mid 2000s. He was portrayed by uh, Pam Greer in Smallville, the young lady whose name I never know who was in The Accountant and also Spartacus during the uh, Arrowverse. And, and Power. Also ably portrayed by Viola Davis in uh, the most recent incarnation of the DC universe. Amanda Waller, quite frankly, should be at least a B-list character. She's been in print for over 30 years. She's been in animation. And she's been in live action, having three different iterations of her, whereas the child has only had one. She even she has, has an action figure. See, right. You mentioned that before. I, I've not seen that action figure, and I, I'm, I may need to get it. I've not seen that. But Amanda Waller is a very, very important character in the DC universe. And as someone who appreciates a strong Black woman, shout out to my future ex-wife, I want, I love this character. So right? Serena, Serena's always already married, dude. Yeah, let that go. I have absolutely no interest in Serena. Have you seen her recently? She doesn't even look like she used to look. That's more power to Serena, you know, Matt props to her, but no, that's not my future ex wife. She knows who she is. Um, <laughs> Suicide Squad, I'm sorry, Secret Secret Origins 14. Well, hold on, hold on, let's 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 show her, um, introduction in in in, in Legends, Legends. yeah. And this is something that we showed last week, we, we talked about this last week, but it's it's right to be shown again. Just to give everyone context, this is the introduction of Amanda Waller into comics. Telling off General Flag, who basically calls her a cotton picker, and he's like, she's like, wow. <laughs> I'm not going to put up with that nonsense from you, basically. Yeah. Yeah. She puts the dude completely in check. He's the alpha male white dude, and she puts him completely in check. Now, understand, that book came out in the 80s. That book came out in the 80s and was written by a white man. And the fact that he created this character, Ostriander, uh, I can't remember his first name. Um, What is his first name? Ostriander's first name? I don't know if it's Roy or Joel, something like oh, that. No, I got it right here. Give me one second. Give me one second. I apologize. Excuse the glasses. John Ostrander. John S. Ostrander, along with others, created this character. He didn't have to make her black. He didn't have to make her a woman, but he did. And from the outset, he made her a strong black woman, which I absolutely appreciate. And I will always give this character her props. Um, he didn't have to do this. You know, this is this book came out in when? 82, 83? Something like and, that. And, and putting her in the blue pumps. Right. When when did this book come out? When did that book come oh, out? I don't remember the year. Hold on, I'll look it up. But at the end of the day, he created a very he created a very strong black character, a black female character who isn't drawn as an attractive woman. I know that there are people who may find her attractive, but you know, she's not a traditionally attractive character like Nubia. Oh, the art was by John Byrne and the writer scripter was Len Wein. Len right. Wein is, is also known as the guy who helps create the storm, the character Storm. Right. Right. So shout out to those creators. Um when when when, when did the book drop? I don't know. I got it. 1986, I said 82. It dropped during the Reagan years. 1986, which is coincidental because in this book, which is the origin of the Suicide Squad, you have pretty much the origin story of Amanda Waller herself. And in this book, Amanda Waller has gone to the then president, um, Ronald Reagan, who was an actor, and is trying to get him trying to convince him 
to reinstate the Suicide Squad. The Suicide Squad was a group of individuals who were outcasts, who were soldiers with absolutely no special powers whatsoever, who fought during World War II, reinstituted during the Korean War and things of that nature. And so this is Amanda Waller. She's not as big as she was drawn in Legends. And she's talking to the president, along with Sergeant Steele uh, Steel at this point. Who's kind of a rival in, for her as well. Right, right. In in more, in the DC universe, Steele, Flag, and Amanda Waller are always bureaucrats who are involved with different organizations like Suicide Squad, Checkmate, things of that nature. They are people who believe in the American way, mom, baseball, and apple pie. Um, in recent iterations of Wonder Woman, Steel has gone up against Wonder Woman. She is, is uh, enemy number one. So he is against her. But all of that aside, these people are very prominent in American government. John Ostrand. Thank you, Pericles. Pericles is still here. What's up, Chad? How you doing? So, you know, in this issue... I was definitely impressed with how they went back into her backstory and told how she got where she is. What's up, Brian? Uh, just looked it up, and John Byrd did, in fact, model Amanda Waller off of Nell Carter. So Nell Carter, back in the 1980s... Give was, me a break! Nell Carter was a uh, Broadway actress... I want to say she was in the original Dream Girls. I may yeah, not. I, 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 I was about that. to say, I think she was in Dream Girls. Yeah, I think she was in Dream Girls that made a movie uh, back in early 2000s with Jamie Foxx and uh, Old Girl from American Idol. But I think Nell Carter was in the original Dream Girls on Broadway. But that aside, in the 80s, she was in a series called Give Me a Break, where she played basically a maid slash nanny to a white family that had Joey Lawrence, who was back in the 80s and 90s, kind of a big deal. He he was a child actor. Um, so he he played in Blossom. He was in Blossom in the 90s. And so he, like I said, he was a big deal. But Nell Carter was the actress who was the star of that show. And she she was a big deal in the 80s. So I can absolutely see the fact that the artist based the character of Amanda Waller on her. So the other thing about this, the Secret Origins book, it's not simply she meets Reagan. Because she meets Reagan, she explains the history of the Suicide Squad. So much of the issue talks about the entire, the inception of the Suicide Squad in World War II and its various iterations over the years up until the 80s when this book takes place. But it also goes into Amanda or Amanda Waller's origin. Uh, yeah, and, that's right. And you see that she marries a man named Joseph Waller. Her maiden name was actually Blake. She was Amanda Blake. And so Waller's her, her, her married name. And they have a bunch of kids together. Five kids. Right. And um, one or two of the kids dies from various things because they live in the Cabrini Green section of Chicago. Her that's husband... Awesome. Joe, you know, kind of fed up with the whole situation of his kid being killed, ends up getting killed himself. So let me back up real quick. Let me interject. So Amanda Waller, like I said, they're basically living in the projects. Okay. Think good times. But they are a nuclear family, husband, wife. You know, you don't have somebody who is a single mom just out there giving it up to whoever or whatever. They are a nuclear family. Their oldest son was trying to get out of the projects, as a lot of young brothers do, by getting involved in sports. He was a basketball player. He was killed by a gang member. That was the first child they lost. The second child they lost was a daughter. Their daughter was raped and murdered by a very known, well-known thug in their area. That's the scene right here. Looks very much like Amanda, a young Amanda. Well, the father was upset at the fact that the police knew who did it, but they couldn't prove it. So dad was like, look, I'm going to take care of this myself. As you see in the second panel, he has probably what's known as a 38 in his waistband. 
And he makes the mistake of going to where this guy hung out and calls him out instead of just not saying anything, walking up, putting two in his head, and walking out. Whenever you're going to commit a crime, you never announce it. That was his mistake, and he ends up dying. Well, Amanda is now a single mother to three additional kids. She gets them through college. Now she puts herself through college and gets her degree in what? Political science. After she's done that, she finds a guy who's running for election in his local uh, district named Marvin Collins who's running for Congress. He doesn't want any help from the machine of the Democratic Party or whatever in his area, and Amanda appreciates that. And then she decides to work for him. She hits the ground running, gets him elected, and then once he's elected, she gets involved in politics and takes off running. She is a true bureaucrat, as I've said on this space before. I appreciate Amanda Waller as a character because she is a strong Black woman who made her own way without any superpowers, without any traditional good looks, who is in control of every environment that she's in. And I really, really appreciate that. Yeah, true, true, true. When we make the jokes about black girl magic, you know, she doesn't have superpowers, but she has her brain and she has her drive yep. and pure willpower to create herself into more than what she was. So she goes from a, a young mother who was a teenage mother um, who's lost her husband, lost two of her children, yep. to becoming this force of nature in Washington. And what's interesting, the reason we bring these books up to tie it into the next book, is she had very humble origins, and her intent was pure. She was like, "I've lost my child to these, these my child and my children. my children, my my children and my husband to these streets," and. There's no, there's nowhere, no one in the system fighting for us. So she goes to this politician and says, we need to fight for our people in this, in, in this area. So she ends up, really, her, her initial intent was to fight for the little guy. She wanted to fight for those who were disenfranchised and looked, looked over in our society. That's very noble. That's superpower. That's superhero type stuff. Where that's where her intent was. I want to make myself into something more than what I am to protect the people that can't protect themselves. That is literally the definition of what a superhero does. And that's what she sought out to do. And that's what she did. So what's interesting is in the next, in this other book that we're talking about, um, this newest suicide squad dream team book um this book has her nephew in it archie waller he's a super he's a superhero um called um dead eye thank you dead eye who has psychic abilities um this whole team has you know there's the it's called dream team there's a there's a there's a character called dreamer who has psychic dream power. She can go into your dreams and figure you out and stuff like that. Who is trans. Um, but she has a very rough relationship with her nephew, Deadeye, Archie Waller, because he's like, you're always using people for some, you know, machinations of, of gaining power. And he has a scene where he calls her out. He's like, you know, you used to be a good person, auntie. You used to be someone who looked out for the little guy. And now you're just this power mad, terrible person. And let me just and she's like, you don't know me. Let me just interject this right here. Nothing Amanda Waller. What a villain. The way I describe a villain, they act in their own self-interest. They are selfish individuals who are trying to gain power, control, money for themselves. Nothing Amanda Waller has ever done has been for her own self aggrandizing or money or power or whatever. She does everything that she does for the betterment of the United States. You may disagree with her. You may not like, not like her motives, but understand that her motives are pure. 
And when I say pure, it is for the betterment of the United States. She is a true patriot. Not those fools who stormed the Capitol January 6, 2020. No, this woman is a true patriot. And I appreciate and respect this character because everything that she has done has been, again, for the betterment of the United States and the world. So I love this character of Amanda Waller. And I will continue to say that as long as I have breath in my lungs to say so. Love her. So there's a scene in this book where Amanda's being introspective about her life. She has this run in with her nephew who basically says, I don't trust you. You've lost your way. You're not a good person. And so she's having this introspection where she's basically dreaming about her husband, her dead husband, Joseph. And this is what actually made me bring this topic up was, you know, I was like, wait a second. I knew, I kind of figured she was married based on what I saw in the Peacemaker show, but I don't know anything about her husband. And so I looked into it and then I see where the first appearance of her husband, that's what brought up that Secret Origins 14 story. And so, you know, if the other thing that's interesting, look at how the other two issues we showed of what Amanda Waller looks like. She's kind of lost some weight in this one. She looks more like the Viola Davis version of Amanda Waller in this comic book. And I'm wondering if that's intentional. But she's having a whole discussion with her dead husband. Now, a lot of times... And he calls, he, he calls her out and says, you know, you've lost your way. Um, you used to, you used to, you you used to re try to represent the little guy, and now you're like Power Man. Now, one of the things you know, when it comes to comic books, a lot of times they will what we call retcon a character, and by that we mean you know an origin or storyline involving the character has been changed in a way that's somewhat different or whatever. So this conversation that we see in the Suicide Squad book is a retcon because by the time Amanda Waller became involved in politics, her husband Joe was already dead. He got himself killed by trying to seek justice for killing the guy who killed his daughter. So Amanda Waller was not working for any politician for all we know, based on uh, Secret Origins 14, she was just a stay-at-home mom. She was the Florida Evans of this universe, right? But then when her son got murdered, her daughter got murdered, raped and murdered, then her husband got murdered, that's when she decided to go to college and get an education. In this version, she has already received her education and is um, working for a politician, which her husband doesn't agree with. That is a retcon. That is a different storyline than what we were initially told. Well, hold on. Yeah. What, what happens here is that this, this whole scene with the husband was actually a dream. Remember I told you there was right. this character no, called no, no, Dreamer. I, right. But Dream, Dreamweaver, Dreammaker, whatever the character's name is, she feels or thinks that that is something that actually happened. And it's making it seem as if this was an actual conversation that Amanda had with her husband. And I and I do see what Paul is talking about. This Amanda Waller is extremely slim, nothing like the original uh, Suicide Squad version <laughs> of Amanda Waller. But check out the shoes, though. Still Those has those are the same type of shoes she had in her very first issue in Legends. Mm -hmm. Except those are green. Check your um check check your DMs real quick. That's the actress who played Amanda Waller's second. Pam Greer, the outstanding 1970s actress, Pam Greer played Amanda Waller first during the Smallville run um on the CW. The actress who um, I, I said to you, Paul, 
I can't remember her name. I'm going to look it up right now. Hold on one second. Cynthia Adai Robinson. Cynthia Adai Robinson played Amanda Waller uh, live action for the in the second incarnation. Right? And so during the early 2000s, they kind of retconned Amanda Waller to be this physically fit woman of action type individual, and they cast her. I don't know which came first, the casting of her or the 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 printed page. I don't like this version of her. Amanda Waller was never the woman of action. She was the woman in the chair, the woman with the plans, the woman who was controlling things. The, well, what's, uh, interesting, what's interesting is this comment from Frustrated Fans. He says, not only that, to force villains to do heroic acts is wild. It, when, when you, and this is why this is so important. When you look at her origins of where she started and what her intent was to try and make up for the evil that was done to her family, it makes a perfect kind of sense that when she sets out to right the wrongs of the little guy, she decides to say, you know, the evil men in this world evil people in this world, I'm going to force them to do good for the greater good of America. And by a byproduct of that is the little guy, those those disenfranchised. Um, so it, in her own mind, it, it, it actually makes kind of sense, right? To and have a suicide squad. I'm either going to kill, I'm either going to have you kill yourselves for being evil people that hurt, you know, the, the 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 little guy, or you're gonna, I'm gonna make you be heroic, and help us in the greater good. It's a weird, twisted way of of her being her own hero in her own head, and I'm all here for That's, it. I okay, so let me ask you this: Do you, Paul, think Amanda Waller is a hero? Yes or no? A hero. Do you think, do you, Paul, think of No, I heard your question. I'm just asking, are you saying hero? Yes. Um, I think there are layers to this, and I wouldn't label her a hero, but I wouldn't label her a villain either. It's, 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 it, to call her a villain would be, to, you, you would still, be, you'd have to call Nick Fury a, a villain. They're the same person, the same role. Chick Fury. I, listen, um, you Nick know, Fury I, does shady stuff all the time. No one calls him a villain as a result. Let, let me say this: I, you know, I have no problems saying what I think and feel. Amanda Waller is, in fact, a hero because what she does again is not for her own self-interest; it's for the betterment and security of the United States. When you yeah. put yourself on the line for others, you are a hero. Amanda Waller is a hero. You may not agree with her methods. You may not agree with her morals, her tactics, her ethics, but she is a hero. Yeah. An yeah. anti hero. Now, see, Sean, here's the thing an anti hero to me would be somebody like Deadpool, um, the Punisher, things of that nature. I view Amanda Waller as a true hero. She's an American patriot. She's a patriot. That's how I, that's how I personally view her. I don't know if I go so far as to call her a full-on hero. Definitely an anti-hero in the sense the definition of an anti-hero is a person who's not doing things out of purely altruistic uh, desire, but ends up doing good deeds regardless. But she's a patriot, though, yes? She's definitely a patriot, but that's just because you're a patriot doesn't mean you're a good person. There are plenty I of people that, are pat that call themselves patriots that are completely evil people, in my opinion. Yeah, no, especially nowadays. But yeah, yeah. No, I, I personally view Amanda Waller as a hero. I view her as a patriot. I have. She's one of my top ten favorite. <laughs> Brian disagrees with both of us. He says not only is she a villain, she is a super villain. Well, what, what's what's that person's name? Uh, that's Brian Wilson. He has a he has the YouTube channel Couching the Slouch Slouching with C Bizzle, which y'all should check out. Support. Well, Brian was dropped on his head a lot when he was a child. Brian is wrong. Wow. <laughs> and Just, um, dude, I I understand your position, but I absolutely disagree with you. 
And this is why we have it. Let me tell you something. Y'all need to give me some control so I can start doing some stuff. Oh, right hell no. Yeah, That's exactly. That's what I thought. That's never going to happen. Um, so yeah, those 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 are good comics to have in your collection. Legends so, number one, um, Secret Origins fourteen, and this latest issue, Suicide Squad Dream Team. Um, I might end up start. I'm crap. I got too many comics as it is. I might end up just straight up collecting this entire run of Suicide Squad Dream Team because the art's good, the yeah, storyline's good. Yeah. I'm, I'm loving yeah. the introspection on. On, on Amanda Waller, who's quickly becoming one of my favorite DC characters, honestly. Yep. Um, I've been collecting Suicide Squad for the last few years now. The older issues, the original Suicide Squad run, um, which was a fantastic, fantastically done run. Um, God, that would make a great television series to do Suicide Squad. Fantastic. So, yeah. So, you know, at I, 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 as I've said during this run, as I've said during previous um, versions of this show or, you know, previous issues or episodes of this show, Amanda Waller is one of my top 10 superhero or comic book characters. <laughs> Brian says, I guess you didn't read Beast World in his, his, his... I did read Beast World. I still stand by Amanda Waller. She I had good this. intentions, Brian. Right. She wasn't doing anything for her own self-interest. She was doing what she felt was in the best interest of the world, okay? Um, John says, definitely a true patriot. She believes in what she does, even if it gets a bit yep. dirty morally. Yep. I love her. Yeah, exactly. I do, too. I do, too. So, of the original, hold on, of the original Suicide Squad run of 67 issues, I have every one with the exception of four. I'm missing 23, 48, 49, and the very last one of 67. Um, Amanda Waller is that tip. And even though I had Suicide Squad uh, issues in my collection, she did not become real to me until the Justice League, Justice League Unlimited cartoon voiced by the able, great uh, actress CCH Pounder. That, for a lot of people, is the Amanda Waller. When I'm reading comic books, I don't hear Viola Davis in my inner monologue. I hear CCH Pounder. That's who I hear when I'm reading these books. She is an extremely great character. She needs all the props and big ups that she can get. And I, and since you mentioned the fact that she has a action figure, I need to try to find that. It's that expensive. Way. It was part of a three action figure set. Um, the lowest I've seen that figure or actually that set, the figure is probably like 70 bucks. My birthday is September for those who want to know, just throwing that out there. So this was like, these were the only two books that we had this week, honestly. Um, so you want to move on to, well, you had something that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Of, oh, go, go to the comments real quick. Make, make sure we get through all we, the we comments. Got, we got all the comments already. I didn't see everything. You, you did. I did. I, I went through every one of them. Uh, if you, oh, here's Brian's comments. So Waller's best intention is to make everyone into animals. Yep. Wasn't for her own best interest. Yep. There would be less war and less yep. racism. I, listen, I stay with Amanda Waller. I do. So tell me why you wanted me to include this. Okay. So this is what I was talking about at the very beginning of the show. If you are of a certain age, and by that I mean 45 years of age plus, you came of age during the 1980s, right? And one of the most prominent rappers of that age was Big Daddy Kane. BDK. What I will say is he was probably the second sex symbol in hip hop with LL Cool J being the first. Mr. C, the individual on the left, was the executive producer of Big Daddy Kane's first album. Uh, show me that picture. 
What? Show me the picture of Big Daddy Kane's first album. Uh, this Long one? Live the Kane was Big Daddy Kane's first album. This is what put him on the map. That album, you know, as someone who came of age during that time, this album came out when I when I was in high school. This tape was played in my Alpine, my stolen Alpine tape deck on a regular consistent basis. This was this was a phenomenal album. Mr. C was the executive producer of this album. Mr. C was also the co-executive producer of Big of Biggie Small's first album as well. Mr. C died this week at the age of 57. So I wanted to give a shout out to him, his legacy, and his impact on hip hop culture. RIP to Mr. C. Yes, indeed. Yeah. He Big Daddy Kane was that dude. And something that I didn't realize or understand until recently, and I'm talking about the past five years, Big Daddy Kane helped put Jay-Z on the map. Oh, yeah. I did not realize that Jay-Z was a protege of Big Daddy Kane. Absolutely. He got his he got part of his style from Big Daddy Kane. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea. I had no idea until the past literally three years. So yeah, RIP to Mr. C. And let me say this real quick. Most of the folks who are a part of this uh this chat are black males. We as a community have to do better with taking care of our health. That means going to get regular checkups. That means getting screened for cancers. That means, yes, getting our prostate checked. There are a lot of things that we as black men have to do to ensure that we are around. When you look at black hip hop culture outside of the murders that are out there, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, God, Tupac, Biggie, Jam Master J, so many of our people who, of you know, of our age, Paul's and our age, have died early. And when I say early, before the age of 60, Mick Jagger and his whole crew in the Rolling Stones, they've probably done every drug in existence, and they're still alive. But our culture, we died before the age of 60, that means we're not doing enough to take care of ourselves. So I would encourage all of you folks who are watching this chat, if you've not been to the doctor, go to the doctor and get checked out. Get regular health screening. My ex-girlfriend, who was a bitch, the one thing that I will give her props for is she got me to start going to the doctor on a regular, consistent basis. And so I will give her credit and props for that, if nothing else. So I would encourage all of you folks who are watching, if you've not been to the doctor in six, seven, eight months or a year or longer, start changing that. Go to the doctor on a regular, consistent basis because we're not doing any good for our families or our communities by dying early. And there are far too many of us who have done so. Black Rob, Heavy D. Um, uh, what's my man's name from uh, Quiet Storm? What's my man's name? Um, Prodigy. Oh. Prodigy. Prodigy, right? Uh, Fife Dog. The list goes on and on. The num, God, Nate Dog. You know, the list of black artists or people who you know we followed and grew up with or whatever who've died before the age of 60 is long. Heavy D, you know, we have we as black men have to do better with taking care of ourselves. So I just want to say that. This will be a good time for that Keenan Ivory Wayans message clip. So 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 this is what this is how you say that you want the um yes Paul yes button. yes message did I lie Incredible. Yep. All right. Um, there was. Well, let's let me switch over to this. 
we're going to take another short commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to get into what's your watch. Batman Shadow of the Bat, number five, written by Alan Grant and drawn by Norm Breifogel, is a tragic story. The story surrounds a vigilante called the Black Spider, a man on a mission to destroy peddlers of heroin. Batman attempts to stop him, but he stops Batman in his tracks, not with superpowers or magical feats. He stops Batman simply with the truth. Batman's coat of honor, which will not allow him to kill, flies in the face of the death the Black Spider sees. The Black Spider, though, isn't some mysterious character with a noble mission. No, his name is Eric Needham, and he was once a slave to the Needle. Eric Needham's mission is personal. His former life has affected his former love and son. And while Batman is trying to stop him from murdering addicts, the Black Spider reminds Batman that we're all addicted to something. This thought haunts Batman because it has a ring of truth to it. Unfortunately, those same addictions can cost all of us our lives and the ones closest to us. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, peace. Here's our black real estate in comics. What do I mean? Let's check out Black Panther. He is gone from the MCU for reasons. And what is happening in the comics? We can complain all day about how our champion is being treated, but we don't own that character. Look at Milestone character, curated by one of the greats, Dwayne McDuffie, my guy. But we don't really own or control any of his characters. DC does. So I'll ask again, where is our black real estate in comics? Meet Delta Dogs from Millennial Comics, created and controlled by us, where story sits in the forefront. Delta Dogs is more than just black characters being black for the sake of being black. This story is about seven cousins that gets into an encounter with a mysterious glowing stranger that changes their lives forever. And with their unique abilities, this family may be the one thing that can save their hood that's being ruled over by a vicious super gang. With an ex-criminal as their leader and other superheroes that looks the other way when it comes to their environment, this will be an impossible mission to pull off. Grab these books in our hardcover Ultimate Edition bundle at millennialcomic.com so we can really have some skin in the game when it comes to the comic book industry. Keep doing y'all thing, Black Comic Lords. Peace. And we're back. And we're about to get into what you watching. So I'm not a gamer, like, at all. Um, no, 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 no. Before we get into that, because hmm. I don't have that queued up anyway. Um, one of the hottest shows that people have talked about this week. Yes, 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 absolutely. So hold on. Has stop. Been Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you watch the recent episode? Did I watch what? Did you watch the recent episode? Yes, I've watched everything. I'm, I'm, I'm completely up to date. You see, you're caught up. X Men 97. Yo, listen, this is give the spoiler warning because we're about to drop. Oh, some absolutely. On this episode. Don't look at it. Shut your eyes, Mary, and don't look at it, no matter what happens. So, check it. Back in the 1990s, I want to say 91 or 92, the X-Men cartoon was a Saturday morning cartoon that was unlike other cartoons of its day with the exception of Batman, the animated series. It had more, for lack of a better term, adult themes, 
It played heavily on the comic book, the source material. It was a very good series with the exception of the very last season. So X-Men went away for a very, very lot of years, right? 30 years until this year. X-Men, <laughs> X-Men uh, 97 follows the original series which stopped back around uh, 93 or so, right? In episode five, which is the most recent episode of X-Men, it, listen, I watched, I watched it when it dropped. I think it comes out on Wednesday. So I was happened to be up like one or two o'clock in the morning. I watched it and I was absolutely destroyed by what happened in that episode. And then as people woke up and they watched it or whatever, the Twitters was all abuzz about X-Men 97 because the creator of, well, I'm not going to say the creator, but the writer and maybe executive producer of X-Men 97, who is a brother, whose name is? Bo Mayo. Bo Mayo. Who From right has, here in Winter Park, Florida, by the way. Oh, wow. Okay who, for whatever reason, has been relieved of his duties as executive producer and showrunner, he has created a phenomenal follow-up to the original series. Now, I will admit that initially I was put off by the show because the animation was different. I really, really like the original animation. I'm not a huge fan of change. But after I got past the first episode, of X-Men 97. I really, really enjoyed it. I do not like the Roberto DaCosta voice actor, actor or his design, but the overall story of X-Men 97 has been great, with the exception of episode four, which was the Mojo episode. Didn't like that. But otherwise, it has been great. Episode five has our heroes over in Genosha. If you recall from the comic books and the original series, Genosha is a nation. Is it in Africa? Where, where's Genosha located? It's off the coast of Africa, kind of like Madagascar. Okay. So the nation of Genosha was much like the nation of South Africa in the 80s and 90s. And by that, I mean it was controlled by the minority. In this in universe, the minority are the non-mutants. They controlled the mutants and made them enslaved to do all the grunt work and all the heavy lifting as it were. Well, in the comic books, the Genotians were freed by Magneto, maybe? I, I, I don't know because I don't have that. But they were free. And so there was a point where Genosha was a mutant haven. Well, the mutant haven was destroyed by. You, you, you're like you're like really going way too fast forward. I mean, understand the episode begins where the X Men decide to send a delegation to Genosha because remember the last episode, Magneto confronted the United Nations. He's on trial for his crimes as a mutant terrorist, and there's a scene where he has the heads of the, tri the, the tribunal who's adjudicating him from the United Nations. He has them at his mercy. He could kill them at a whim if he wanted to. And he says, if, if I was the monster that you all thought I was, I would simply kill you right now. But I'm putting myself before you, submitting myself for your judgment. But understand, you people have not been kind to us. So when you point the finger at me, you really need to point your finger at yourselves. Because, you know, you're aware of the indignities and crimes that you have created against mutants, and you have the audacity to, to have uh, uh, animus towards us when we react. When we react. If anything, we're, we're, we're showing restraint in what we do in our, in our natural human reaction. So they take this to heart. They let him go. And in fact, they said, hey, you know what? We're now going to recognize Genosha as a mutant nation amongst, as, as a nation amongst the United Nations, as an official country. And we'd like to send uh, Magneto as a delegate over 
to Genosha, and the Genosians said, hey, Magneto, we want you to be our president of our newly formed UN-recognized official country. And Magneto says, I'll do it under one, one, uh, one uh, condition, that you allow Rogue to be my, I don't even know how, how they really phrased that. I mean, it was kind of like, right. be my queen, be my... My co leader, so basically, okay. So, <laughs> I wasn't gonna go into, I would assume that those of you who are watching uh, X Men 97 are aware of all that. I was just going into this specific episode. And what Paul says is absolutely correct. You know, the nation of Genosha in the original series was freed, the mutants were freed from slave, slave, sl enslaved thanks to the intervention of the X-Men. And so they've kind of just been out there willy-dilly, whatever. But now the mutants have taken over this nation of Genosha, and they are going to be their own mutant haven. Because, you know, mutants across the world, doesn't matter what you're, where you're born or whatever, you can be born with the X gene in America, Sri Lanka, Russia, Paris, you know, France, whatever. But because mutants are feared or whatever, the nation of Genosha was going to be their haven. If you are persecuted wherever you're from, come to Genosha, you'll be safe, right? And the, 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 scene, the scene of Genosha has, literally looked like Wakanda from the movie. Like it had a Wakanda vibe where people were like, Wow, this is us for us by us, you know, doing that FUBU thing. Right. So the, those who were in charge of Genosha and in the animated series in this uh X-Men 97, you had the White Queen Emma Frost, you had Sebastian Shaw, who is nothing but a capitalist. They're like, okay, we're the ones who are kind of controlling uh Genosha right now. Magneto, because you have been the most prominent advocate for mutants, we want you to be our leader, your our region. And Magneto was like, look, I'll do it, but on one condition, I want Rogue, as Paul just said a moment ago, to be my queen. So I can have her rule by my side. Now, there is a lot of thoughts uh, out there on the on the interwebs that Valerie Cooper, who is a well-known American bureaucrat in the Marvel Universe, in X-Men 97, a lot of people think that Valerie Cooper is being cosplayed by Mystique. Because when you look, we watch the episode. If you've seen it once, if you've seen it twice, we watch it a second or third time. When they tell Valerie Cooper, who's there on behalf of the United Nations, that Magneto will be ruling with Rogue at her at his side, she takes certain interest in that. She's somewhat shocked, taken aback, because understand, Mystique, the shapeshifter, was Rogue's surrogate mother, and her response seems to be more in depth than just a bureaucrat. A lot of people think that Valerie Cooper is Mystique, and I'm starting to think that as well. Um, Another thing that was kind of interesting in this episode when they go to Genosha is the amount of cameos. Like, if you're... Mm -hmm. I Look, I've collected X-Men comics since the 80s. The 80s. Back in the Chris Claremont run. Um, so I'm a long time X-Men reader. Um, the amount of cameos they put in this, in this one episode were huge. Yeah. They, every single scene, you have to almost pause with the use your remote and pause every scene and look in the background and you'll see characters from various X-Men comics over the decades, um, they really went hard in doing cameos like these you see here. Mm -hmm. Leech and Pixie 
and Herman Glob. Leech showed up in the original uh, X Men run. Um, what's the clear guy's name? Uh, Herman. His name is like Glob. Glob, 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 Glob. Yeah. Like, these I'm are characters. A lot of these characters were from, honestly, the, uh, and shout out to Bird Without Fear, who did a really great review on this episode. He pointed out that a lot of the storyline, a lot of these characters you see in the background were actually from Grant Morrison's X-Men run. Um, so that's kind of interesting. There, because the original series took place in a certain period of time, this is the period afterwards. And so they're actually drawing from different eras this is supposed mm -hmm. to be X-Men 97, but they're actually drawing from different eras and throwing it in this episode. Yeah. Um, they're taking storylines yeah. and characters from different X-Men eras and throwing them in the episodes. So you're now, really getting a summary of the X-Men universe. Now, I never had in my collection the destruction of Genosha. I think that was the new X-Men, right? That was, that was shortly around that era. Uh, Cassandra Nova was actually part of the big bad, um, Charles Xavier's Charles yeah, Xavier's yeah. sister. Sister, right? See, I don't have any of that in my collection, so yeah. you know, yeah. I'm I'm kind of new to that or whatever. But at the end of the day, this episode of X Men ninety seven broke me because I didn't know what to expect. It just. Uh, so many, you know, Paul already gave the spoilers. If you haven't seen it by now, oh, I haven't given the biggest, the biggest spoiler. But so many people, so many X characters, so many mutants died because they are having a ball over in Genosha. Then all of a sudden, out of the blue, Sentinels appear and they just start killing people willy nilly. Body, some of your body, favorite characters, body. some of the background characters. It's just absolute mayhem and chaos. When I watch this series, when I watch this episode at like two or three o'clock in the morning, I was just sitting there like, oh my God, what have I just watched? And then later on that day, I guess it was like Wednesday, and we see people started watching it. I'm pretty sure that X Men 97 was trending because everybody watched it. It was a powerful show. Shout out to the writer. It, it just, it was spectacular. It was yeah. a win. On that point of what you just said, shout out to the writer, Bo Mayo, who is the writer, as I said, from here in Winter Park, Florida. Um, he got booted off the show when the, two weeks before it premiered. No one, no one really knows why, except they said maybe, I don't know, the way he was acting. Or I, I don't know. There are two things that I've seen. Supposedly, he was an asshole uh, to the staff. Second thing is, supposedly, he had an OnlyFans account or something. I I don't know. They didn't but, get over that because this dude wrote an incredible... He's been writing incredible episodes. His episodes every single episode. have been spectacular. He has when, not said much on social media since his ouster from Marvel. Yeah, he did indicate that if you liked episode five, you like what episodes else? eight through ten yeah. are gonna blow your mind. Yeah, yeah. The only episode that I haven't really liked was the Mojo uh, episode that focused on uh, Roberto DeCosto and uh, Jubilee. Mm -hmm. I didn't really like that one, but other than that, these episodes have been spectacular. I manifesto says Genosha was a slave yep. apartheid. Absolutely. Slave. Absolutely was Absolutely. was a. I want also want to know what happened to the indigenous African folks on the island before Europeans came. Oh, they were killed, obviously. Obviously killed off. I mean, that's yep. that's what I was saying. Hype style, leech. Now, here's here's what's crazy to me. Here's my here's my leech theory. Can I give my oh, leech theory? Before you, hold on, before you go to leech theory. All, All right. right. So in this episode. In this episode, Magneto is facing off against this very super sentinel creature. Leech, as a character, his uh, mutant ability is to siphon off or to stop the powers of any mutant around him. Well, Magneto is sitting up here trying to fight this Omega-level sentinel while holding on to Leech. So that shows you that Leech is probably draining Magneto's power 
while he's fighting this character. And Magneto is so strong that he's fighting this character, but still on the opposite side, saving saving Rogue and uh, Gambit. It, this 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 episode was so very well done. It is just I can't say enough about how good Magneto has written. My ahead. my leech theory is this. So Magneto's holding up a shield to protect Leech and other children that are around him. Literally protecting the children. Morlocks. He, Morlocks children. Magneto is saving Leech and other Morlocks. Yes. Right. Morlocks. Uh, Leech is a child. Um, he's also holding uh, Rogue and Gambit back. Trying to protect them from trying to jump the Sentinel and get killed. Uh... And then big blast from the Sentinel, and the Sentinel says, you know, because remember, all Sentinels have mutant sensors. They can sense when there are mutants around. That's their that's one of their things that they're known for. They can immediately sense where mutants are around. And and after the big blast, the 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 Sentinel goes, mutant threat eliminated. I oh, think man. Magneto survived. I think he covered himself with metal, and Leech sapped his power. Which made him register as human, and made him, made the Sentinel believe that he had been killed. That's my theory. I think that I I understand what you're saying. I think everybody there was killed. I think everybody that we saw killed was actually killed. But there's going to be some timey wimey. In the immortal words of heavy spoilers, there's going to, uh, which is another account that you should follow. There's going to be some. Uh, timey wimey wibbly wobbly stuff where everybody comes back at a certain point due to time travel shenanigans, either through cable or bishop. That's what I think. Uh, Bo Big points out the decimation of Genosha is how Emma Frost got her diamond powers. It's true. I never, I never knew that. That was her secondary mutation that she got. Right, I know it's a secondary mutation. I never knew how she got. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that we see, as you see in this picture here, my man Gambit. Now let me tell you something. He was Gambit has, has always been a very popular X-Men character. His power set uh, it includes the ability to kinet kinetically charge objects. Uh, not living tissue, but he can kinetically charge objects and make them explode. He likes to use playing cards because they're so small and thin, he can charge them very quickly without even ever thought or you know, use of a lot of energy. And he can toss them and do various destructive things. But he can charge very large objects as well. It just takes a little bit longer. He went out last um, year. This dude had the most incredible scenes. In all of the comics, remember what I told you? I've been reading X-Men comics since the 80s. I have never seen Gambit unleash the way that he did in this in this in this episode. All right, so this check dude it. died, but he went out like a full G. This episode was called Remember my name. My name, Gambit. Remember it. I mean, God, I twisted up. Right. I so twisted up. This episode was entitled uh, Remember It, right? Yeah. And if you recall in the original series, I don't remember what episode, Gambit was going against somebody. He's like, my name is Gambit. Remember it. In this episode, okay, so Gambit has loved Rogue for a very, very long time. Even though the two of them cannot be physically intimate, he, Gambit, has been in love with Rogue for a very long time. In this episode, Rogue is like, look, I care for you, but Magneto has asked me basically to be his queen. We can actually have sex, so I'm going to go with the physical versus the emotional. That's yeah. what it boils down to. Yeah, right? that made me so mad. It, it, you know, and, and Gambit is like, okay, well, we can still be friends. My opinion, Gambit went out like a scent. There's no logical, emotional, or moral <laughs> reason why you should be friends with someone who has 
reject it. Oh, damn. You don't have to cuss them out. You don't have to break their car windows, flatten their tires. You don't have to do any of that. But you don't have to be their friend. So when he, Gambit, said that to me, the person that I am, I'm like, okay, you know what, Gambit? You're a simp. But or, or he part. genuinely loves her and wants her to have wants her to be happy. And if if Magneto can make her happy because he loves that's her, he wants her to be happy. Behavior. Okay. Okay. That's simp behavior. I you know, you may disagree or whatever, but that is simp behavior. Well, I'm not I mean, I'm sure if the situation happened with you and your wife, you would have the same. Oh, wait, you don't have one. So At the right. end of the day, just because the person that you want to be with doesn't want to be with you, you don't have to hate them, but you don't have to say we can still be friends. If you say that, you are a simp. If you disagree, <laughs> you're a simp. Sorry, not sorry, right? As the Lawrence report says, Magneto got that touch, though. Magneto can physically be with Rogue. That's what she's wanting. She wants to get the spear of Basinga or Magneto or whoever. Lord, why does he keep doing this? Just... <laughs> it, is, it is what it is. I mean, that's just natural. That's just normal, right? <laughs> Like I said, y'all got to give me that button, too, so I can start pushing buttons whatever I want or whatever. But that aside, Gambit, as a character in this episode, to some people, he showed a lot of maturity, if that's what he wants to see. But at the end of the day, he went out like a G because he... <laughs> Episode he was injured by the Omega Sentinel and he kind of you know played possum so he could get into a position to destroy it. I you know it, Gambit was that dude in this episode. Oh yeah. they you be friends, they just gotta be cool. What hold on, pull that back up. <clears throat> it can be friends, they just gotta be cool when you take advantage of new. I don't know that I agree with that because I don't know that I understand all of that the way it's written. But no, no, I just Listen, um at the end of this episode, you are emotionally bereft because of yeah. how much stuff happens in the last 15 minutes of the episode, 10 yeah. minutes of the episode. So much pops off. Um and it's a culmination of all these emotions and you know, when you view things from the lens of Rogue, she has the elation of, you know, rekindling this relationship with Magneto, um, having Gambit, who loves and adores her, being made co-leader of a the mutant nation. She's at the highest point of her life, right? She's, she's living the dream because now she's the co-leader of a mutant utopia which is the dream that all the X-Men had. And within seconds, within moments, the, no the nation is destroyed. Yep. Her old boo is killed, saving her life. Her new boo is killed, saving her life. She's got no man. She's got no nation. Um, wow. So much happens in this episode. This was this was a very, very powerful episode. It was very well written. Along with what was going on in Genosha back here in the United States in Westchester County, New York, you had Trish Tilby, who was interviewing the X-Men. You had Beast and Cyclops right. who were being interviewed to try to put the public face on mute. Now, Trish what Tilby I do, don't know, I, she's a long time, she's a long time character, X Men character in, in X Men right. comics. She's a news reporter, dated Beast at one point. Right. What I disagreed with when I was watching that is I'm thinking, okay, you may not necessarily have secret identities, but why would you want the public to know where you guys live, considering how the Friends of Humanity, the FOH, has treated you guys? You're putting a literal target on your backs. Why would you do that? So that was the only issue that I had with that. But it was very, very interesting 
because she, Trish Tilby, was interviewing Scott Summers. And Scott, who has been, you know, Professor X's pet boy, pride student, brown noser, was basically kind of taking the, the position of Magneto for a certain point in time. And I've seen right. comments on the Twitters that basically said that Scott is more interesting as a character when he's not the bootlegger for Xavier, but kind of takes the position of Magneto. And I do agree with that because- Yes, absolutely. Scott, Scott, Scott Summers gets a lot of crap. People think of him as a Boy Scout. If you read X-Men comics, you realize that Scott Summers is anything but a Boy Scout, um, particularly over the last... I mean, there was a period of time where you could argue that, but definitely the last 20, maybe even 25 years, Scott Summers is not a Boy Scout. That's, that dude, be he'd be putting in work. Um, he's, not a, he's not ashamed... To stand up for mutant rights, he is one point labeled a terrorist in in, in mutant uh, mutant relations with humans. There was there was a phrase that was popular called Magneto was right. There was a period of time where the that 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 phrase got switched around to Cyclops was right, because Cyclops is like I'm tired I'm tired of acting like we're inferior to you. And and this episode in the interview with Cyclops by by Trish Tilby. You see the beginnings of that. You see the first time, for the first time, him being that Scott Summers. Because he's like, you know what? Why would she's like, why would you tank your own interview? I'm trying to do a, a publicity piece to make you guys look good. And he's like, I'm taking it because I shouldn't have to sit here and make us look good. We're human beings just like you are, except we're better. I'm tired of having to pretend that we're not. And it's like, wow, didn't see Scott like that. This was an extremely good and that's, episode. That's, that's the Scott Summers that if you read the comics, he's been like that for him. He's been like that for a while. This was probably the best episode of the five thus far. It was extremely well done. The writer of the episode, what's his name again? Uh, um, Bo Mayo. They need to hire that dude back. I don't care what he did. Oh, Bo Mayo actually makes a cameo appearance in this episode. He and I think his boyfriend uh, make a, a cameo appearance. It, it was they do? Extreme. How? I'm sorry? How do they make a cameo appearance? What are you talking about? When you look at when you look at it, they're during the uh, Sentinel attack, you can see him as a character there. I'll have to I'll have to see that next time I watch the episode again. Yeah. I'm yeah. definitely gonna watch this episode again. I watched it again tonight. I watched it the second time. I was so torn up that um I couldn't watch it immediately, but yeah. Yes, the expansion is always getting attacked. Scott Channel K dot like that in interview. What else? I know you just circa 19. He's post monitor is better, much better, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> What, oh, um, what the other comments? I didn't see all the comments. That that was it. That was it. Okay, but look, you, while I'm talking, you have the tendency to pay a lot of the comments that I'm not watching or paying attention to. So start. I, I literally video. showed you all the comics at, that you were that you just read since the last time I showed the comments. All right, moving on. There was another thing that you wanted to talk about that you wish to another show. Okay, so as I was saying initially, I'm not a I'm not a gamer. Um, Fallout is apparently a very big um, game. I don't know what platform it's on. I'm assuming it's on uh, uh, PlayStation and Xbox and all this stuff. I don't know. But they made a series of it. And I want to say it's like maybe nine episodes. I'm up to episode like seven or so. And it stars the phenomenal Walton Goggins. I first became familiar with Walton Goggins based on his uh, performance in The Shield, which was an early uh, 2000s show. Um, he was also in one of my favorite shows ever called Justified as Boyd Crowder. 
he does the voice of Cecil in uh, Invincible. It, Walton Goggins is that dude. If you've ever seen The Hateful Eight, if you've not seen it, I would highly encourage you to watch it. If you have, he was a dude who would call Samuel, J Samuel L. Jackson Black Major. He was also in Django Unchained. Walton Goggins is that dude. I'm a huge fan of his. But he is the star of this show that is a post-apocalyptic show that is based on a video game. I have absolutely no idea what the video game is based on. But here in the United States, we were apparently at war with Russians. Walton Goggins was a movie star who got involved with this uh, company who was selling basically doomsday bunkers. And the show is cool. It's kind of corny or whatever. The reason why I wanted to mention it is because top right on the screen is a guy by the name of Maximus. He's a black character. Not a fan of that character at all. Um, he, he's stupid. He's just... He's not a strong person. He's weak as hell. He's dumb as hell. But he's black and he's in this series. Walton Goggins' character on the left has survived nuclear fallout. The character in the middle, um, I don't remember her character name, but Lucy. she was basically born and raised. Her name is Lucy. Lucy. Lucy was basically born and raised in a bunker. So she has a very naive view of planet Earth based on her isolated upbringing in this vault. For whatever reason, which I'm not going to go into, she has to go above ground. Walton Goggins character is above ground, and the black dude's character, whose name is Maximus, is also above ground, and she interacts with both of them. It, it's it's an interesting show. There's some... It, it's not the best show that I've watched ever, but it is entertaining. I would encourage you guys to watch it. Um, it's on Amazon Prime. How so, many episodes are there? Like I said, I believe that there are nine, maybe 11 episodes. I'm about to look that up now. Um, I've seen seven of them. I'm almost done oh, wow. with it. Hold on one second. Yeah, I, I, I know you wanted to, to talk about this, so I watched the first episode. I enjoyed that first episode. I, I didn't know there was nine episodes. Um, but the first episode was good. good just to go a little bit more depth. Um, eight episodes. It's eight episodes, and I'm on episode seven. So this this world, this Earth, is different than ours. It starts out in sort of a 1960s Earth, but it's a different looking 1960s Earth. It looks actually sort of slightly more futuristic, almost. Think Jetsons. Think Jetsons. I was about to, I was literally about to say, think the Jetsons in yeah. terms of its style style. Um of what the 60s thought the future would look like. That's that's what that world was. And in this world, uh, you know, the nuclear holocaust actually happens. Many people driven underground, they form these, these bunkers throughout the world called vaults. And the vaults are somewhat interconnected. They don't really um, interact with each other, except in dire circumstances. Um, so these people have been kind of inbreeding within the, the vault. And so they will try to exchange with other vaults people for marrying purposes so they don't have to expand their genetic, their genetic uh, pool. And um, they also will exchange like seeds and parts and things like that, they can, you know, barter system. But these people have done underground. So from the nuclear holocaust, 219 years pass where they're living in these vaults for 219 years. They don't, they literally have no idea what's going up on the surface world. Um, and so things happen, which I'm not going to spoil, but Lucy, who lives in this vault world her entire life, has to go to the, uh, to the surface world, um, in search of something. And, um, you know, Walter Goggins' character is someone who was at the original Holocaust in the 1960s, 
and 219 years later, he's still alive, so to speak, because he's been mutated. We don't, at least I only watched the first episode, so I don't know how he became mutated, but he's lived all this time. Right. And right. he's now like a mercenary, bounty hunter, bounty hunter right. gun for yeah. hire type guy. Um, he's and, a resident badass. He, he's the baddest character in this universe, even though he didn't start out like that. He started out as literally a movie actor who's married to a black woman who works for the vault company. And all that will be divulged later on. But well, don't, don't tell me more because I haven't, I haven't read, not, I haven't I'm gone not, to those episodes. Um, but he's kind of a Jonah Hex type character. Um, and then Maximus, you know, he's, he's a soldier type guy. They take these children and, and turn them into these knights. And he starts out as a squire to a knight. Um, based on this picture, it appears that he apparently becomes a full blown knight. I don't know how yet. I haven't got that far. But it's, a, it's an interesting world. Yeah, it um, is. what I like about it primarily is that it's original. It's your I I don't, literally don't know where they're going to go with the story because right. it's completely original. It's not derivative of something else where I can say, oh, this series is like this series or this movie that I've seen before. It's completely original, and I and I dig that because it's so rare to have truly original works in this day and age. So I love the fact that I don't know what's going to happen next. Or I can't guess. So that's that's kind of cool. Yeah. Lucy is my favorite character because she is so pure of heart, pure of intention. I she's my favorite character. Um, not a fan of Maximus the black dude at all. He's just he's just dumb. <laughs> Gray, who I apparently actually plays the game, says it follows the game rules. You're born in the vault, something happens, and you got to venture out into the world to start your adventure. That's what's up. I think you were for it. I, I've never, you know, obviously I've never played Yeah, I've, I've heard of Vault. I'm obviously a Fallout, but I've never actually played the game myself. Yeah. No, I did. But I, I, it really I, makes I, me wonder if they really should mine more of these video games to make them into television shows and movies, because a lot of video games are very creative. I think about most recently also the Halo series. Uh, uh people yeah, had a lot of, the first the first episode the first season had a lot of criticism. Um the second season was much better uh, on Halo the series. I watched the first season I've not watched the second. Um the second season's better. Second season's definitely better, but there's less of him in the suit. That's probably my biggest my biggest criticism. He doesn't really wear the suit that much, and that kind of really defines the character a lot. Right. What What was it? Master Chief. Master Chief. Yeah. Yeah. That's a video game I actually do play. It's actually my favorite video game is Halo. Right. Next one I'd love to see is Gears of War. Gears of War would be phenomenal on the screen. You know, since we're talking about stuff like that, World of Warcraft, which is not a, it's a computer game, as far as I know. That movie was to me <laughs> style says this is that where Red Skull ended up after Endgame. <laughs> and it should have had a sequel at this point. I know they set it up to have a sequel and they have had one, but that was a very good movie. I really, really like World of Warcraft. Yeah, it wasn't a bad movie. It was a very good movie. I think perfect. That is it. So that was, you know, that was pretty much it. There were no new, or from what I collect, there were no uh, new comic books that involved black characters or black creatives other than the two we discussed. So that was pretty much it. But before we get ready to go, once again, make sure that you hit the like, subscribe, and follow buttons on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Well, just to recap real quick, because you said there wasn't much that came out. There was actually quite a few things oh, that came out. One of the books was... Week. What's coming out next? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, Spider-Verse number three had this new character called Su um, Star Spider in it. Um, 
Other thing of note, Red Hood of the Hill. Mark, I suggest you get this run. Red Hood the Hill, very good book. Um, Resurrection of Magneto is really a, a storm book, so that's one to get. Yeah, I do have um, that. Your Unnatural Order. This is the book you put me on. That Wait, came out that episode, that issue came out? Yeah, issue four came out this week. I did. I, they didn't put it in my pool. Well, you need to talk to your LCS. You're not yeah, doing a good job. Yeah. And the next one is very good. I really enjoy a natural order. I didn't know that the most recent issue had come out, so I'll be calling them tomorrow to ask them to put it in my box. It was coming next, out next week. We have a Green Lantern War Journal. Look at these two covers. These covers are phenomenal. This is a Raza cover. I like that second one a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's dope. Um, Miles Morales, Spider Man, who just reached his 300th issue. Moon Man number two finally drops. People have been waiting on this. It seems like it's been two months since the first. Issue. I have number one. I still haven't read it yet. It was good. <clears throat> it was real good. Um, Spawn 352, Spectacular Spider Man. I did not want to like the book because I have enough comics. And I was like, I have Miles. What do I need Miles and Peter Parker? But damn it, this book was actually good. And the art's by Humberto Ramos, who I absolutely love. So uh, I'm torn as to whether or not I'm going to keep buying the spectacular Spider-Man. It actually wasn't half bad. Star Trek I'm buying. This is the, this act. Shout out to Star Trek, IDW Star Trek. This one actually won a few awards or is nominated for a few awards for just being that good a series. It's actually one of the highest rated Star Trek series IDW has ever done. Uh, the newest Mace Windu comes out. The blackest comic book of all time by in Star Wars. The writer, artists, and characters are all black. In fact, it's the writer. Here's the cover artist, Mateus Manahini. Um, writer, Mark Bernardine. Artist, penciler, Georges Genty. Inker, Dexter Vines. Colorist, Andrew Dollhouse. The main creators on the book all black so let me your editor okay. hold senior on, editor me hold on let me finish let me finish make senior sure that you guys contact your comic book stores to get on the uh pre-order list for this book specifically all right so the main art the senior editor robert simpson he is in charge of all Star Wars books at Marvel. So Mace Window is literally the blackest Star Wars comic book of all time. Anyway, that's all I want to point out. But that's what's coming out next week. Um, I think that's anything else. Oh, Ultimate Black Panther number two. How can I forget about that? Wait, we've already had the Ultimate Black Panther number two. You mean number three? Uh, why does it say it says 417? Oh, it's a second printing. These are second printings of Ultimate Black Panther number two, but number three also comes out. And Zuriel by Concrete Comics comes out next week as well. Looking forward to that first issue of that. What's what's Ultimate Black Panther 3 about? Enter Storm and Killmonger. Black Panther takes matters into his own hands and embarks on a covert solar mission to deal with Ra and Khonshu directly. Wakanda's conflict with Moon Knight has escalated, even with spies all across the continent, feed continent feeding information. Wakanda is overwhelmed. Everything changes, though, when a pair of freedom fighters enter the fray, Ultimate Killmonger and Ultimate Storm. Let's check out these covers. Here's cover A. This is the design variant by Peach Momoko, who is okay. I don't know why she's so popular. The ultimate uh, Spider-Man book. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not that. Afraid. I'm not a big Peach Momoko fan, to be honest with Me you. Either. I'm not a fan of hers. And she certainly can't draw black people very well. Uh, this is a dope cover yeah. with T'Challa and Okoye. This is the one in twenty-five scan. Sarizan can't pronounce his last name. Incentive variant. It's pretty dope. 
This is the boss logic. Ooh, look at this. Ultimate special variant. Who's that supposed to be? T'Challa, maybe? I don't... Oh, there's an axe in the hand, so that's Killmonger. Killmonger's weapon of choice is usually an axe. Right, that's cool. This is the Joshua Kassara variant. That's going to be a hot one. You know where you have T'Challa and Storm on the same cover? It's always usually a hot cover. So, yeah. That's what you have to look forward to next week. So next week we will be back and we will be doing nope. our review nope. of nope. Ultimate nope. Black Panther I'll, number uh, three. You may be back, but I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be. Oh, that's right. You're not. You're not available. So we're not going to have a show next week. What's the week? What's next week? The twenty first. The nineteenth. The twentieth. But the twentieth. And yeah. I will be hopefully at the. Um, Brooklyn Comic Book Festival for the week after that on the 26th. So, so you're going to New York? Yeah, I'm going to go to New York. When? The 26th. It's it's the 26th and 27th, I believe. So you're going to so you're going to go to New York on that Friday? I may go Thursday night, but certainly I'll be there on Friday. Well, I should be. Well, you know, I don't know what your schedule is going to be looking like, but I should be available that Friday. Well, probably, yeah, probably that Friday. But if you're not, I understand. But I should not be available next week because I got something I'm going to be doing. So yeah. I'll let you know. I mean, it depends on what goes on. I mean, I'll be streaming from my my sister's apartment in Brooklyn. Right, you know, and tell her I said, hey, I hope she's Certainly. all right. Uh,. What are some of the comments before we get out of here? Sean Damien Hill says Storm looks incredible. She does. I love I love the the natural locks they put in her hair. That's kind of dope. Mike Super Slab says some dope covers. And then Gray says Mass Effect would also be a good one to adapt. That's a video game. Okay. Yeah. All right. So thank you all. If you're watching us, we got like 61 pe people watching us. Before you click end. Please like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed to our channel and help us out so that we can keep doing these shows. Um, until you have anything else, Mike? No, no. Just make sure that you send uh, Bo Biggs a shirt or, or a hoodie. A hoodie for as much money as he's I will giving. do it as soon as you give me the money to go ahead and print one. No, he's giving you enough money for him to have a free hoodie. Sure. Appreciate you, Bo Biggs. All right. With that, we are out. Black comic lords, we got you.